Well, I think it's uh, time to call the meeting to order. And uh, roll call is the first order of business. Okay, the next order of business is the approval of the uh, Budget Committee mi uh, minutes. I think you all received them yep. in the mail and have read them. Is there any corrections to these minutes that uh, anybody has? We'll move to approve. Second. Okay, there's been a motion to approve. And Don, does that include all three? All three, yes. All three. And there's been a second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Passes. Okay, at this point, I'm going to turn the meeting over to Danny, and it's basically his meeting to explain uh, this budget is not explained in a lot in real detail, but it's the concepts that we want to agree on, and I think. Uh, Danny will go through the steps here, and if they have questions, I guess we ask them as we go. Sir. And I would hope at the end of, uh, before we go into executive session, we can have a, save some time for some discussion. Sure. Uh, so let me just say, that essentially I started this meeting the second year I was here to help set budget targets, um, essentially to give me some direction in working with the departments to prepare a budget. Um, prior to that, the county administrator would just prepare a budget and present it to the budget committee at the, during the budget process. Uh, so essentially the purpose is so that I'm putting together a budget that primarily the principals you guys have directed to put together before it even comes to you. Um, the number three item on here speaks to county budget policies. When I'm mostly giving the history for the new commissioners here because I know most of you know this, but when I first became county administrator, we didn't have any budget policies. What we had was budget committee verbal policies, essentially, but nothing that had been reduced to writing. So I drafted these policies based on those verbal policies of the budget committee to help direct the departments in how to prepare budgets. Um, these policies cover things like that we won't backfill the loss of any state or federal revenue. Um, well, they cover a lot of things, but. Uh, the reason why I put it on here is each year I bring these back to the budget committee and ask, are you okay? Are these still the policies that you want me to prepare the budget by with the uh, departments? Um, we, we really haven't had any major changes in, in these policies this year. Last year we had some uh, update of the investment side of the policy, but these have carried forward year after year. Um, so you probably all haven't had a time to review those, but you don't have to decide today that you want to change those policies. We can change those as we go through the process, but I want to make sure everybody had a copy of them. The next thing, and I want to make sure that this is put on the record to uh, determine the uh, issue with our Home Rule Charter Section 15, which speaks to local budget law, and I included a copy of the page from our charter that I'm referencing. And essentially, um, the specific issue that I want to talk about here, I talked about with you last year and in prior years, is the uh, preparation of a supplemental budget. So right now, uh, this uh, portion of our char uh, charter, this charter was written prior to current local budget law. Local budget law requires a public hearing for a supplemental budget, but this, this charter was written before all of the requirements of local budget law existed. So the charter required that the budget committee shall review a supplemental budget. Now it doesn't say that you have to do that as part of a hearing process, but you could choose to do it as part of a budget hearing process rather than the commissioners just holding the hearing for the supplemental budget. 
In the past, what the budget committee members have asked me to do is to prepare the supplemental budget and submit it to the lay members for their review. If they have any comments or concerns, they give them to me. And if not, the budget uh, supplemental budget process is conducted by the Board of Commissioners. So I want to make sure that that's the way you still want to proceed with supplemental budgets. Uh, and Dick, I would ask maybe that you ask uh, for a, at least uh, you know what the majority of the budget committee's preference is, so that we can have it on the record. Could we wait a few minutes on that until Craig gets here? Mm -hmm. I'll move on. Uh, the next thing we have here is. Uh, I guess I should explain the other purpose of this meeting besides setting budget targets is to kind of give you an update on what's going on in the budget process this year, what we expect from now to the end of the year. And this is kind of loose because we still have six months of the fiscal year and all sorts of things can happen in six months. Uh, we can get unanticipated revenue, we can have unanticipated expenses, we can have legislative changes, which we commonly do, which change our budget uh, significantly from what I'm telling you today. But uh, you guys typically ask me, you know, where are we at with our fund balance? Essentially the rainy day fund. Um, and I want to say this is just the general fund. This, this has nothing to do with dedicated funds. You don't set budget targets for the general fund, or I mean for the dedicated funds. This is just how we're distributing general fund. And uh, so essentially the beginning fund balance on 7-1 was uh, 47 million. $443,717. This is just the general fund. Now, roughly, our, our uh, dedicated fund fund balances were probably around 40 to 45 million. So, um, but this is just for the general fund. Uh, we had projected 49 million. So this is less than we projected. However, the reason why that is, is because, and I'll go through this, is we, paid $4 million to uh, increase the capacity of the parking garage at the Health and Human Services facility. From the general fund, so the general fund would own it, we're going to execute a lease agreement with the Health and Human Services Department who are going to pay us $4 million back. It just didn't get captured in this fund balance, but it will increase our fund balance um, by the end of the year when we receive the payment. So we'll actually would have came in a couple million dollars over what we projected if that four million dollar transaction hadn't occurred. Um, <clears throat> so uh, included in that fund balance were prior year carryover requirements. So essentially, we want to back those out. Um, now that doesn't mean that going into next year's budget, we also won't have prior year carryover requirements, but these are from the previous year into this year. We may have some going into next year as well. I'm not accounting for those, I'm just showing you the things that were in this budget this year that we're backing out. Um, and those total about 7.3 million. The, the big one I want you to pay attention to because a lot of people ask questions about our $17 million increase in fund balance, and I talked about a big portion of that was because we received a loan for the Health and Human Services facility that went into our fund balance, but we have to pay it back. You'll see that debt service at 6.5 million. Uh, uh, we won't pay that whole 6.5 million. We pay an annual payment for five years. Uh, it's about 1.3 to 1.5. I can't remember exactly off the top of my head. So um, that 6.5 will be reduced by that amount and then carry over as fund balance in the next year. But I'm backing it out so you see that that's not available. We're going to make it for debt service. Now we took that, you'll remember, we took that loan at $8 million for 1%, but we invested it and then earned almost 2% interest <coughs> off of it. So we actually netted an income off of that. Are we on the first year of that? Uh, this will be the second year. We made a payment in the okay. current year. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So I, you know, most of those things I don't really need to go through. I don't think you, they, they probably look familiar to you all. And for those that they don't, of course, you're welcome to ask questions. Anytime, we can stop now or we can wait till we get to the end. Um, we always set up general fund cash flow requirements. This is the amount of money that we need in the general fund to fund services from July 1st until we collect taxes. So that rainy day balance is what you guys typically like to know, the $30 million. 
so that's after we've accounted for one time, essentially one time prior carryover expenses that could be also one time expenses next year and our cash flow requirements. So things that are going to impact next year, but moving to the next line, these are the things where you guys asked me to tell, tell you what the future holds. <laughs> That I don't really have a crystal ball, but these are the best guess estimates. Um, we're looking at about $12 million in revenue. Uh, these are things that we didn't budget. Okay, now they're 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 essentially one-time funds. They're, we won't get them every year, so they go to our fund balance. But as I said, we'll get the $4 million payment from Health and Human Services. I put in here the ONC payment. Now I don't know if that's going to happen or not. So that's why we don't budget it. Uh, we, we can't budget it unless we have a strong reasonable belief that it will happen. But I put this in here because every year that I've been here, it's been funded at some point. Um, I think last year it was April, I'm sorry, April before we got uh, funded. So, you know, it, it's just and until Congress figures out what they're going to do, we're not budgeting it. But I'm putting it in here as a potential revenue. Library services, this is the amount of money that we budgeted for libraries that the district will pay. Um, and that's not all general fund per se. Uh, it's general fund and then the roughly 800000 from uh, the, video, or the video lottery funds. Now we have identified <coughs> those funds come to the general fund. So Essentially, we treat them as general fund, but we have to account for them to the state. So we have to explain to them where we spent them. And libraries qualify as economic development. Um, you'll see in next year's budget targets that we essentially assign that to the sheriff's office because that also qualifies for. Now, this isn't additional money. It's general fund money. It's just how we have to report to the state that's different because we don't have to report to the state how we spend non-dedicated general fund. This is essentially dedicated general fund, but it has to be dedicated toward anything the state says is economic development. Uh, and then the OSU Extension District. So expenditures, uh, these are, you know, not necessarily all set, but I'll go through them. We have, we, we've been working, in this year's budget, we had budgeted money for the conceptual design of, the, of a new DA's office facility. Um, and we have got architects estimates right now, so this number could change, of about 6.2 million to build that facility out. Um, now, that 6.2 million dollar expenditure hasn't been approved yet. Uh, Good morning. Sorry, I'm late, everybody. I thought it was at 8:30. <laughs> Well, you're early then. I know, that's what I was thinking when I was driving. I'm like, early. Will you amend the uh, roll call for co You don't work for the college or anything, do you? No. <laughs> <laughs> so this $6.2 million expenditure has not been approved in this year's budget yet. We'll have to come back to the board. We're waiting until we get all of the design uh, information ready, the RFP ready, to see if the board whoever that is at the time we bring it with wants to fund this in this year's budget or consider funding it in next year's budget um, I have talked with the board through this process and I essentially will be recommending that they do it in the current they authorize it in the current fiscal year which will mean we won't complete the facility in the current fiscal year but will essentially encumber these funds which will be then one time carryover prior year carryover uh, and essentially the reason being is because we had budgeted for the library and OSU uh, costs and we're not going to incur them. So essentially we have a revenue in our budget that means we won't reduce the fund balance we projected. Uh, the Justice Court building, um, that is actually already in the budget uh, this year. 1.5 million, we've acquired property for that and we have the design for the facility. And we should come in on that number. Um, the first estimates were a little high, and we had them cut it back. Uh, so, but that's already in the budget. Where's the location of that? It's, uh, you know where the Super 8 Motel is out past the airport on the way to Central Point? It's right across from that. Okay. It's in the city limits. It wasn't in the city limits, 
but it was surrounded by city properties and we had it annexed in Tennessee. And we got a, a really good deal. It was a one acre, uh, or two acre lot. Two acre, and it was what would we end up paying on the third? We're still actually negotiating the sale price. We've got two more wells that we found on the property, so we're going back and forth right now. They want to close and do one, they want to give us money to close and that kind of thing. So we start out uh, $170,000. So we acquired a great property for a really low cost. Um, the next one is the Expo RV Park. So this is a complicated project, and uh, I want to explain it, explain it pretty much all the way through. I do have uh, capital projects um, listed on here next that we're that we'll be going over, so we can discuss more of it there. But uh, we're, we're estimating that project to be 2.8 million. That will be a general fund loan to the parks department. It will affect our fund balance, but we will get paid back, and then it will generate a revenue to our parks and fair and expo. And I'll go over that in the capital projects portion. Um, <clears throat> we had another expenditure of 300,000 for Southern Oregon Historical Societies who came in met with the Board of Commissioners, requested uh, $300,000 in operating revenue, and uh, the Board um, approved that request. That's part of the supplemental budget that we'll be doing. So before that payment's made, the supplemental budget has to be approved. Is this a proper time to have a, some discussion on that? Sure, if you want to. Why are we, we went through this with the Historical Society over the last 10 years that I've been here and we finally closed them out, saying they didn't meet our spending priorities. And they run a pretty inefficient shop and uh, so forth. Why are we funding more money for an operating budget? <clears throat> What's the situation? Is a one-time capital thing they're doing or something they need money for or is this so just here, an operating budget shortfall? I, I, I'll let the commissioners answer why, but let me talk procedure a little bit about what you just explained. Mm -hmm. After uh, Measure 50, we had a lawsuit with Southern Oregon Historical Society and essentially they claimed that their <coughs> operating levy or their district, their tax district, was rolled in and became part of our general fund, that money should be dedicated to the purpose of providing for the historical society. That's not true. Measure 50 eliminated the authority to collect that tax and any other tax at the time. And so we went, and I'm giving you the basic That's right. That there's yeah, more I'm to glad it. You're refreshing our so they sued us. They sued the county. And we went to court and we prevailed in circuit court and we <coughs> prevailed in the appeals, court of appeals. Before it went to the Supreme Court, um, we entered into a settlement agreement with them. Essentially, they said, look, we can't just be cut off from funding and expect to survive, so will you agree to transition us off of your funding? And we did agree, and I think we paid $1.7 million to them over three years. And at the end of that three years, they were supposed to be self-supporting. We also provided them all of the facilities that the county owned for a dollar a year as part of that settlement agreement so that they could take those buildings and turn them into revenue. Um, at the end of three years, they weren't able to do that. Uh, we did, the first year I was here was the last year of the payment we made to them on that settlement agreement. So that happened before I was here. Uh, but that's kind of roughly the brief explanation of it. Since then, a lot's happened. Um, they've obviously went through a lot of downsizing. I wouldn't say they're not running efficiently now, Dick. I think they're running pretty efficiently, but they had a tough time getting there. Um, they came back and asked the county for more money. Uh, our board of commissioners at that time agreed to front them a $200,000 payment that they were supposed to pay back at the time we sell the U.S. hotel in Jacksonville. Um, so that was another $200,000 we paid them. Between that time and now, they couldn't maintain the facilities the county provided them. <coughs> um, 
So we negotiated a transfer of those buildings to the city of Jacksonville, except for the U.S. Hotel and their White City facility where they store all of their artifacts. Uh, and Jacksonville took responsibility for all of those buildings. Now, there, there was some liability with those buildings because there was a lot that had been neglected in their care by Southern Oregon Historical Society, but they were also still an asset to the county. So um, we got rid of the liability, meaning our tax, county taxpayers didn't pay for it, and Jacksonville took the liability, meaning likely the city of Jacksonville taxpayers <coughs> paid for it. Um, so we thought that was pretty much it. Uh, they received a loan from Alan DeBoer, I think, for $750,000 to operate. Alan DeBoer leaned the J.C. Penney's building, the old the building that they occupy downtown, as collateral against his loan, uh, and he has been in here lobbying commissioners, I mean, a lot, uh, for funding. Um, and I, you know, I mean, obviously he has an interest in doing that because he loaned them $750,000 and if they go broke, he's going to own a building that he doesn't want to own. Um, and then, uh, so they came in and asked the Board of Commissioners last year to refer a tax for them to create a district, a tax district, and the Board of Commissioners declined because it's not a county function, essentially. Uh, but at the time, um, I think it was Commissioner Breidenfall told him that he would like to see them come back after the election to see if they may, uh, if the Board of Commissioners may want to fund them. So Allen approached the commissioners again with the director from SOHS, came in, talked to the commissioners, and request, requested this funding, this $300,000, and the board agreed to do it. So that's essentially, you know, the rough history of what's happened there, and I'll let the board answer the rest of your question. Yeah, I'll jump in. Essentially, Dick, what it is is, um, I know the, uh, the official legal side of all of it and how it works, and the lawsuits and everything else, but there is still an underlying current out there in the community that the community feels that they funded the historical society through a, a payment, and they voted for that. With that being said, that hasn't really gone away and it's in a large portion of the community. So, there's, I guess it's twofold. We have a large inventory of over a million plus artifacts that, that uh, essentially would either be sold or be somehow distributed that are basically belong to the public right now. Uh, so we have to find some way to preserve those. If they do, they're in a financial position where they're uh, a very minimal revenue. They're trying, they've done quite a bit to change their operating process. As, as Danny alluded to earlier, they have downsized substantially and reorganized new board, and they're in the process of trying to find ways to generate that revenue. The, the loss of those artifacts was my chief concern. It wasn't down on the board or his money being turn back then, that was actually the least of my concerns. Is this money going to pay back its loan? This is, this is basically given to them at this point in time. To pay his loan? No. It has nothing to do with Alan to pay loan. Do you have any restrictions on that? That's the contract that we asked. To well, we didn't, have, we didn't ask for a contract. You just said to give them the money. But let me, let me say this. Um, I didn't say that the commissioner's interest was in paying Alan DeVore back. I said Alan had an interest yeah. in getting his money paid back. And while this money may not be directly going to Alan, other revenue is now available to Alan to be paid for debt service because this money is going to fund their operations. So, you know, I don't want to say it's not going to Alan, and I do want to, don't want to say it is because it's directly not going to Alan, but indirectly it's making them available to make debt service payments to him. Their proposal was to have the county fund them this three hundred thousand dollars and then in two years they want to go after another tax and um they the, you know they left the door open to coming back to the board uh, they've tried twice to gather enough signatures even to qualify for a ballot and can't don't they don't have the public support to do it uh, but you know the board can refer a district so that's why they came a couple of times and asked the board to refer it 
Yeah. Doug, my time goes back a couple years ahead of Danny on this. They used to have something like 30 people working for the Historical Society and accomplished nothing. They ate up. And then when they, we downsized it to the, uh, what, what was that number, a million seven or something? A million seven. Yeah. Over three years. Yeah. yeah, over three years. They were forced to downsize it. And we told them, you got to have a long-term plan. You need to put some of this in reserve. You need to do a lot of things. And the board was just adamant they weren't going to do it. They paid it all out in salaries again. And the only way uh, they finally came to uh, getting their financial house in order was when all the money's gone. They had no money and they had no choices. They'd done a damn poor job of fundraising. From my point of view. Those artifacts you call them out there are just short of junk, in my opinion. <laughs> I've been through that thing. We do, the county furnishes a building for them to store them. And that stuff's been stored there since I've been here, and not a thing really has been done with any of it. They sold some off a couple of years ago, right, April? But it just sits there. It's not, uh, you know, <clears throat> it's an elitist bunch of people that, in my opinion, run that organization. And it doesn't have the support of the community. And I think to enable them to continue the way they seem to continue by funding them with money is a total mistake. And it isn't in the county's budget spending priorities to do this. And I don't understand why you're even <coughs> considering it. And if you don't have any uh, restrictions on it, or you're not trying to tie it to the sale of the property in, in uh, uh, Jacksonville, and recover that, I'm not sure uh, why you're just handing 300000 bucks. And besides, this should go through the budget committee. This is not an emergency. It's not something unexpected. And I think this kind of expenditures by the board is weakening the budget committee. And, and I, well, I'll talk about that a little later. But there are some other strong views on this, and I think what you need as a, uh, the commissioners, you're going to have all kinds of pressure on you now because we got a sur budget surplus. Everybody's got a, a cause. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants money, and they're all coming through the door, and you start su supporting one, the other, uh, other guys are going to say, well, why not me? Why not me? And all the rest of the commissioners I've dealt with said it's for our protection to run these kind of things through the budget committee where you have three lay people on the committee that don't have to worry about votes and all the things that uh, you folks do. And, you know, I think it protects you from uh, the pressure of the people that are behind these things seem to have a lot of um, support, but it's a lot of times very narrow. And, you know, if you want to make the budget committee irrelevant, then just start approving a lot of this stuff outside the budget committee. And a lot of us will say, hell, it ain't worth it. We worked really hard over the last 10 years to get this budget in good financial shape. And all of a sudden this year, I see this and some expenditures for uh, economic development. You add that up for three years, another 300 here, almost a million dollars that you folks have uh, spent outside the budget. And it isn't. There's money there. You got the authority to do it. I understand all that. But I don't think it's good policy. And I think these things are. Uh, kind of come around and bite you. Anyway, I'm through editorializing. <laughs> <laughs> but by I God, I put a lot of time in on this historical <laughs> society. This really upsets me, as you can probably tell. Fair enough. I guess I could speak for both sides on that one. 
Um, Alan DeBoer, we need to be very clear, he did this and probably expects never to get his money back. Uh, he has, I served on that board, I left angry at them a couple of <coughs> years ago because I didn't think they were being financially prudent. What I don't know is, are they now? And that would be my biggest question is, where, what are they really going to do with the money and have they really changed their ways? We did a lot of hearings um, when I was there. The county, generally, we went out into all the communities and did focus groups on how do you feel about historical society. The county, the buildings, nobody cared except Jacksonville. Uh, as far as the artifacts and as far as the library, the county does care about that, the people in the community. They do care about the written history. Dick, they do care about that crap out in the building. <laughs> the written history, they've done a good yeah. job on I'll admit that. Yeah, yeah. They care about that. And, and to the extent that they survive, we do need to see them survive, but we need to be sure that we're turning the screw and that they're being prudent with the money. That's my opinion. Here. You know, uh, I'm under the impression that if we didn't fund this, that they would fail. I mean, they're ready to close the doors. And, uh, and, and the way I looked at it, this is just some things, I mean, everything we do in the county just isn't about locking up bad guys. We have parks. We do some good things for the community. And we can say the parks are self-sufficient, but some of them aren't. But we still have those parks. And so I look at the historical society along those same lines. And, and I've said before, I grew up at that Jacksonville Museum. That was a high point of my youth is going to that. And so, uh, so I just feel that historical society is important to the Valley to preserve our history. And I understand, you know, uh, uh, your concerns. Uh, they have a new director. Well, he's been there a couple years now, the, the fellow from... Uh, yeah, from I Texas. Don't, I don't yeah. know anymore, tell you. About a year, yeah. And uh, and in my mind, the presentation he gave, he was impressive, and, and he has tightened things down. And they have very little staff now. Their main focus now is on this library downtown and uh, and all the photographs and artifacts in there. And, uh, and I think it's important that that maintain. I think they're down with five or, five or less staff for the organization. Well, I hear all that, and nobody's arguing that. <coughs> but we're... Here to, <coughs> we're here to protect the taxpayers' money. That's what I feel my responsibility is, just like you guys. And is this a good expenditure of taxpayer money? In the past, the budget committee and the boards have said not the way uh, they're being run. And now you've changed the game. And, uh, and again, there's two issues, whether that's a legitimate expenditure or not. There could be debate, you know, obviously is. Yes. Yeah. I have a little problem these people coming direct to the commissioners on stuff that ought to be going through the budget committee. That's part of my problem. Yeah. Nick, I don't disagree that this committee is for the, the, uh, the budget and for the money. But as commissioners, we have to look at it for not just the corporate well-being of the organization for the county, but for the, uh, what the people need, what the people want. We have to balance a whole bunch of different things besides just the corporate interests of Jackson County and the political interests, of course, also. And, and sometimes that has to weigh into our decisions as what's best for the community and what, can still, what the corporation can still do. With that being said, um, that was my, my thoughts on this, as saying, as I Commissioner, echo Commissioner Rasher, they they're on the verge of not being here. I can't see a community where our history is gone. But I, I, I love the museums. We don't have a museum here in Jackson County whatsoever. And that part of that culture is kind of missing. Now, is that responsibility of government to create? No, not necessarily. Um, you can make those same arguments in the budget committee, and you get the uh, uh, effect of having three other people that aren't burdened by that same problem of you just mentioned that you can get their input and there's you know if, if you're right you can probably get the vote through and it last year at this time I had been Danny sort of talked about it with the uh, with the uh, charter I had come and asked say hey look we're doing all these supplemental budgets we're not including the budget committee I don't know if you remember that or not I asked a question and the 
budget committee basically said, you guys are doing great, things are fine. And M sent us down and said, continue down the path, sort of like what Danny just outlined. If we do something, it gets run by, and then we move <coughs> forward. So it, what I'm hearing a little bit different here at this point from what you just said is that when we start working on these issues, that you want to be included in that. No, I just think the proper format is just like we're doing now. If there's something out there that makes some sense, you bring them through the budget committee and there's a budget set up and uh, it's argued out and you take care of it. Now, if it's an emergency or something unexpected, that's why the uh, contingency's there. And that's what uh, you guys are paid for, to handle it. If you don't want to do it that way, uh, I recognize we're just a recommendation. And I asked to bring you guys in. We don't have any, you know, basically any authority. And if you guys don't want us to have any authority, then we don't have any. Well, I think, Dick, I think you're wrong. I mean, <clears throat> I was going to wait and take your wrath on the economic development, but I'll step in right here. <laughs> is that, I can't, is, is your issue, I mean, really, let's be honest, is your issue the fact that you don't think that, that uh, the historical society is deserving of this, even though we think that we, as we, reviewed what their new plans are and so <coughs> or is it the fact that we we end run the budget committee and I don't think we've done that but it, let's let's get that out on the table so what it's what's both. the real issue it's, it's kind of both I don't know enough about the new organization because I'm not privy to all the facts I well, don't know that's I know what the history of budget so, that's reasons on so I know so the history budget. of that organization and I, I'm, I'm really not that. impressed and it's been a long, hard fight to break away the buildings, get a budget that's halfway, you know, we went to court over it, a whole bunch of things. Well, And if you we want to support, if you think the county should support this, then I think it should be brought before it ought to be a part of the budget committee. If this is a one-time thing, uh, and it's not going to happen in the future, and you've got some ties or restrictions on the money. Hell, you're a banker right now. You're, you're bankrolling this company or the, this organization. Have you insisted on anything that they change or operate differently or protect their money, or is this going to go on in the future? And that, I think we're using up too much time. But these are just my views. That's a good point. Okay, I we'll want to talk some more about it, but I think some others. <laughs> That sounds like I can move on. <laughs> yeah, I think we beat it enough. So the next thing I have listed is the uh, library and extension districts, and you'll have a page that looks like this that shows tax levies. Yeah. And I mean, everyone knows that the two districts passed, and there's not not a whole lot. I've already showed you what that means for our fund balance when we first started. Uh, the the library district. When they were first formed before they, the board took office, we met with them and recommended that they levy no more than 52 cents. Um, and we put together an operating budget that showed them how they could operate under the current uh, operating model for the first year and then add the hours of the second year without increasing that tax rate. They, you'll see, you, you notice that they actually initially announced they were going to impose a 60 the full the full tax rate they actually backed off back to what we recommended um, but this essentially just shows you what happens you know when we levy a tax we don't collect it all so when people say we're levying you know nine million dollars that doesn't mean we're going to collect nine million dollars because we don't collect a hundred percent of what we levy we budget 94 percent roughly so what that means for the library district is they'll collect 8.5 we budgeted 8.3 so that essentially would create a fund balance for them of $150,000, which, um, which which will carry them through their, their operating budget because they pay us back for carrying them through the first several months of this year as part of our contract with them. The 4-H district uh, levied five cents, so 874,000, we budget 90, or we'll, project 94% collection, the budget 781. Now, those two districts aren't required by law in the first year to have a budget committee or have a budget process that 
involves public hearings and all of those types of things. They are in year two. Uh, in year one, the Board of Commissioners will authorize uh, an agreement with OSU Extension for how these funds are spent, and the Board of Commissioners are the ones that levy the tax. Um, we, we've been negotiating those agreements both for the facilities and for operations. Uh, a little bit surprising to me is that the OSU Extension director went ahead and hired people assuming that we're going to give them this money, which the Board of Commissioners haven't determined yet, so that probably wasn't a, a real good move, but um, we'll, we'll, we'll deal with that when we get to the process of the Board authorizing the contracts for service. And then we have the White City Lighting District, the Enhanced Law Enforcement District, and then the Jackson County uh, tax rate. I don't know if you have any questions about any of those. Okay, I'm going to move on. The next one is Economic Development Initiatives. And I put this on here because the board made some decisions since the budget process to invest in economic development. Um, well, this is our budget targets, and you guys don't work ahead of me on the budget targets, but you can look at the budget targets. I was going to say you can look at the budget targets, and you'll see the amounts under county under the county administration budget for economic and special development. So, essentially, we are we already had 102,000 in economic and special development. Um, that 23,000 you see backed out is for Taylor grazing. Um, we have a we have included in that 102 is a $26,000 payment that we made to so ready already. What the board authorized, and I put on here a three-year contract. Remember, budget process only binds for one year. The contract will bind for three years with a termination clause. But they asked for three years, both uh, so ready and then a contract with Mark Von Holly. Um, the board, we haven't executed these contracts yet. We're negotiating the contracts with them, but the board authorized proceeding in the manner to bring the contracts to them in the amount of $175,000 per year to So Ready and $100,000 a year to Mark Von Holly. Uh, and um, the So Ready came and made a proposal about what they would do in terms of service delivery for that amount of money. Uh, the board's asked me to you know, kind of pin them down on the service delivery with performance measures or outcome measures. So that's essentially what I'm doing right now in terms of negotiating the contract. Mark Von Holly came in and made a presentation to the board. And in that presentation, essentially said that he wanted to focus on recruiting high-tech companies. He had a plan about how he was going to proceed with that. He um, asked for a $5,000 a month essentially the tainer contract for his services and then the balances for an expense account. So roughly 60000 of that 100000 goes to pay him and then 40000 goes as reimbursable expenses. It's not a, he has to submit claims for reimbursements for activities related to business recruitment and they have to qualify for reimbursement. Um, in Mark Von Holly's case, he's apparently recruiting two other companies that are also going to each pay him $5,000. So he'll essentially earn a hundred and eighty thousand dollars a year, yeah, and then uh, he'll have you know a hundred and twenty thousand dollar expense account. Um, <clears throat> Mark von Holly's contract is contingent on him qualifying the two other partners, uh, which he has not yet done. He claims that he'll have it done within the next couple of weeks. Um, he's told me that a couple of times though since we. Uh, started this process and he's he's changed who those partners are from the time he came in and presented it to the board uh, and I, the so ready contract I believe passed unanimously and the Mark Von Holly contract passed a uh, two to one vote but a quorum agreed to it so uh, those are to me those become operating expenses that's why they're in the budget targets I listed them to talk about them I'll get back to them in the budget targets but I wanted you to know the amounts and, and essentially the process about what happened there. This was another, this was actually a request by the commissioners to put these two things on the agenda and have these people come in. Um, Commissioner 
Skundrick asked for a presentation from Soil Rating Commissioner Rasher asked for a presentation from Mark Von Hawley. Uh, so we put them on the agenda and they came in and made presentations with requests for funding, similar to that of the SO, Southern Oregon Historical Society, one that you already talked about. Um, I include them in the budget targets because if we're going to pay them out for three years, they become an operating expense to our budget, not a one-time expense. In the past, the board has also done other economic development initiatives, uh, and they've funded that essentially from contingency for the most part. Um, you can see that we've certainly spent through our contingency between this and the other expenditures we've made, so these will, that's why they're included uh, in projections for the fund balance, the SOHS uh, contract is, because we'll pay that out now. Um, these will be de minimis because they'll be monthly payments once we get a contract in place rather than a lump sum payment like we made to Southern Oregon Historical Society in the current fiscal year. So I'm assuming we'll have a contract in place before the end of the year. We may not. And, um, and if we do, then we'll begin monthly payments for the fiscal year on those amounts. Uh, which will affect our fund balance, as I said, de minimisly because they're not huge amounts of money like the one-time payment to Southern Oregon Historical Society will more significantly impact it. And do uh, you have any questions about that? So is that <coughs> with the Historical Society money how you get to the 575 that was on that other thing that was sent out to us yesterday? Yes. Yeah, I don't have a supplemental budget. Okay. Money, but, yeah. okay. How many other government entities uh, uh, participate so already? And does anybody participate in Van Holly? The uh, as far as governmental, of the city of Medford, city of uh, Grants Pass, Josephine County, city of Ashland, city of Eagle Point, the small amounts of them. The, the four major funders are Josephine, Jackson, Grants Pass, and Medford. That's so awesome. That's so ready. That's so ready. Pardon me. So ready. Yes. None. None. Well, I don't know. I can't say from Von Holly. I don't know that. What none, 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 what none what do. None do fund Von Holly. With so ready, there are other participants. None to this level. No. Uh, Josephine County, I think, pays twenty six thousand. The city of Medford. So we'll 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 be paying them. What two, did we used to pay? Twenty six thousand. And why was it? What's the need for that much more money? Well. And you've heard me say this before, Richard, and that's the reason I said I'm ready to, you know, absorb your, your anger, but is that they have been wholly, woefully unfunded or underfunded. Compare them to uh, the uh, economic development folks out of uh, Deschutes and those three counties there in Bend. Uh, uh, it's minuscule. They've done a great job. They've been recognized to do it. For what they have, they have a staff of three people. And uh, they just don't have enough people to get to get what done what we think should be done here in economic development. They've increased their funding from the private sector. I challenge them to do that. <clears throat> they have their they bought that this year uh, with a plan to up again next year. So, but they've come with a plan on where they would like to see this money spent. And uh, uh, and as Danny said, he's working out the contract on that on the uh, on the follow up. Oh, but. This is, in our opinion, in my opinion, I'll say that, I won't speak for my fellow commissioners, this is an opportunity to get so ready doing what it's supposed to be doing. It just has been so underfunded before it hasn't, and they've done a pretty doggone job, good job concerning what they've had. And uh, this is for the folks of Jackson County. This is, we're, we're trying to build the economy here. Read the paper, whatever, crime, whatever the situation is, people won't have jobs. And that's what I'm all about. That's what I came into office on, and that's and, and I have <clears throat> we, we've done a couple of things earlier, and then we backed out of that, out of the contingency fund. Uh, but here was an opportunity to give them a chance to, to do what I think uh, is going to be very helpful for the folks of Jackson County and get jobs in here, and then we'll back out of it once they get once they get rolling. And my my hope is, well, the plan is is to get private sector. Uh, participation much higher. It's hopefully low as well. So that's it, Dick. You see, three years as adequate, or 
is that a beginning or what do you I mean how do you view that well I would say but when I talk to their director I would say three years would be about it because by then if they haven't done it if economic development is a situation you just don't throw the switch I know I'm not telling anything anybody doesn't already know this but it takes a little bit I understand. to get things going okay three years we should be able to start seeing okay some movement and uh, with some reportables that then will be up to the <clears throat> the board after that but three years gives them a running chance to see I mean uh, who knows they don't want to go too far out but you by one year in my opinion one year isn't enough that just gets them we did that once uh, in 2011 and we funded them for a little additional money not to this extent and they hired a person uh, by the name of Smith and got the uh, Nexus deal going e-commerce it was really good and then we, we just couldn't fund it any longer that position collapsed the effort collapse so it takes a little while to get that up and going so is that what Danny's working into the contract yeah. so we either mm -hmm. recognize success or we don't so we know whether to continue or that, get out of it that's correct is it contention at all on raising private funds to match it <clears throat> no well I don't that's not, not what we do we directed Danny to do but that's uh, that's something that the board as they come in and make their reports or quarterly reports, I would expect that's something they'd be looking for. I thought I heard you saying always in budget committee that you couldn't make commitments for the next three years. I, I was sort of surprised and yeah, what really I, laughed when I saw it in the paper because I thought, what are we doing here if, if you can do that? No, what I said, I did say essentially it's a non appropriations clause. One budget committee can't bind another budget committee. Right. I explained all this when So Ready came in and Mark Mahali came in, but I'll explain it here as well. I put this in here as a three-year contract just because when something is a reoccurring charge, it becomes an operating cost. If this was a one-time expense, I wouldn't have put it in the budget targets because that would have just came off the fund balance. But because we're going to have it multiple years, I'm projecting it as an operating cost now, which is something we hadn't done in the past. We just looked at this as one-time expenditures. Um, what happens, though, is that one budget committee can approve this this year. The next budget committee doesn't have to approve it next year. So they can, but they don't have to. Now, what happens by by law, by, by ORS, we're required to put, and it only applies to counties, it doesn't apply to cities or the state, only applies to counties, we're required to put a non-appropriation clause in the contract. What that means is that if a, if a budget committee doesn't appropriate, to spend the money, the contract uh, is terminated. Now, if you don't appropriate, then that does do things to the county. It could affect our credit rating because now we're not paying a bill that we agreed we would pay. Um, it can affect our ability to bond. Um, so there are consequences from that. The other protection, though, is not just what the budget committee can do or not, it's what the contract provides for. And every one of our contracts provides for a 90-day termination notice for no reason. I mean, for just because we say we want to terminate the contract. That's according to our local contract review board rules that are adopted by the local contract review board, which is the board of commissioners in our county. And so if a budget committee is going to say, hey, next year we're not funding this, I give a 90-day notice and we're out of the contract hopefully before the new year starts. Now we may have a couple of months where you know we have to fund it within the appropriation we have, not receiving a appropriation specifically for it, but there are those protections. There's also in the contracts uh, protections for non-performance. So if they don't perform, we're allowed to terminate immediately. So uh, there's all sorts of ways for us to get out of the contract. The reason why I included it in the budget targets is it's a multiple year reoccurring charge. Don, we'll see how good your judgment is in a few years. <laughs> well, what, wait, whoa, whoa. what about Van Holly? Is he competing with So Ready, or what's really well, what's the deal I, there? I, I was uh, a no vote, so I, I won't speak to that. You were the no so vote. So I'll, okay. I'll explain it to you. He, he's, you know, for funds, Don's position was that he didn't want to splinter funds. Okay, that was really the main thing. Mark's proposal doesn't compete with So Ready. It is a specific focus on something that So Ready more broadly. Does. I mean, so really doesn't just focus on the tech sector with a specific plan for recruiting tech companies. They will also recruit tech companies, but more generally and broadly in their recruitment processes. Um, 
they don't do the things that Mark is proposing he's going to do, which is going to fly down to Southern California, essentially, and spend time getting these companies who are interested in relocating to come to our county. He will have to work with SoReady because when they do decide they're going to come, if they decide they're going to come, then SoReady is the manager of our enterprise zone, our renewable energy zone, their, uh, uh, of our technology overlay uh, zone, and for them to qualify for all of those exemptions, they would have to work through SoReady. Also, SoReady, you know, if it's a big investment, SoReady is a liaison to the governor's um, uh, strategic investment uh, program, which makes tax exemptions uh, uh, for infrastructure development over 150,000, uh, 150 million uh, exempt. So the first 150, maybe it's 125 million, 150 million uh, is taxable. But if someone builds a half a billion dollar plant, the 350 million wouldn't be taxable. And also, the governor's strategic investment program provides an avenue for uh, income tax exemption for eight years. And so a company, so if Mark does recruit a company and wants to get access to all of those things, he has to go through SoReady. So I wouldn't say they compete, I would say they have to work together. Now the question is, you know, two of the commissioners voted in favor of it, believing that he'll be able to accomplish what he said he'll accomplish, or at least give him the opportunity to try to do it. Mr. Chair, if, yeah. if I could add something, if you listen to Mark's presentation, he brings up some interesting things. Uh, and he points out Amy's Kitchen. We all want Amy's Kitchen, but his philosophy is that the people that work at Amy's Kitchen are, are the lower wage and are probably not producing enough tax income for the services that we give them. So his focus is on higher wage jobs uh, rather than, than let's just bring people here and put them to work where, where maybe they're not, uh, they're not supporting you know, the taxes they pay would not support the services that they're demanding. Chair, and I'll be frank with you. As you well know, in economic development, 36 months is just a courtship to be able to bring people into this area, to relocate businesses. It's a long, arduous process. And what the future holds on it will depend on the performance during this time period. So this is a decision we're going to have to be looking at in the next few years and monitor the program pretty heavy to be able to look at where it's going to go. If it's starting to bear fruit and it looks like it's going to ripen, we can, we're going to have to do something to continue to invest in it if we're going to look at bringing jobs in. If, if it doesn't look like it's going to ripen, then we're going to have to look at something is, and say, what's the vessel of the future to carry us forward? And I think this, uh, in my opinion, this two-prong approach is going to give us a, a good idea of what that vessel might look like in the future as this thing starts to progress. Um, there's a lot of uh, controversy uh, at times on uh, what SoReady is doing, a lot of frustration, but like Commissioner Skundrick was saying, they've been severely underfunded. These funds are dedicated to hire that person to go out and headhunt those companies and bring them home. Van Holly is basically hired to go headhunt and bring high-tech companies back into Jackson County for the jobs. If one thing about economic development, to my understanding at least, if you don't do anything, we know what the, the outcome is going to be. If we don't try to do something, then we don't know where it's going to end up. We can at least try. That's, people are needing the jobs. Our unemployment rates are there. How do we do it? There's another prong to this, and it has to do with the universities and the education and help, helping them come along to be able to develop the workforce to be able to fill those jobs. And I think there's some discussion and work that's been happening at those levels to start marrying up the high school, the community college, and potentially our, our local university to start bringing that stuff along. We get Southern Oregon to put in an engineering course that would help. Well, be <laughs> careful not to compete with our, our, our friends across the hill in Klamath because they have such an excellent program. We still that they're, they're As a us. aside, yeah. I'm on the <coughs> advisory committee to the community college. They're thinking of bringing, uh, working out a, a situation with uh, right. uh, OIT to bring in uh, technical courses right. that OIT would teach here, which I think is really a critical plus if they can put that together. If we can get the workforce trained up, it's going to give us opportunity to help bring them here. And that's 
kind of it's it's a bigger picture approach, and this is just one piece of that pie. Well, it, it, I'm I'm more interested in the results from this. I mean, I mean, monitoring the fact that they're doing something with the money we're giving them. That's what bothers me. Just like the uh, historical society, is it business as usual? Or is there an obligation to use this money or to make changes or et cetera? Just like we did with the fair. We insisted changes get made. They weren't getting made. And I'll applaud the commissioners. They replaced the board members out there. And I think they've got a board now that's proactive and making some things happen. Yeah. And that's. This, this is this going to be monitored by you? Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll answer your question, but I'd like to move on. Yeah. I don't want to run out of time. Last question. Uh, essentially, um, this, well, as I said, will have all sorts of contractual requirements, including performance measures, reporting to the Board of Commissioners. <coughs> Typically, we do that quarterly. Um, and it will be tied to what they propose they would be doing. Uh, and that is. It is different than SOHS. SOHS is just we're giving them three hundred thousand dollars. There's there was no ties to it. This has a lot of requirements in in contracting that I'll prepare and bring forward to the board for their approval. But there could be a tie if we uh, said the money had to be repaid if they sell that hotel, right? Or well, we did we did that last time. We tied two hundred thousand dollars to that. I actually suggested that was an option to the board of commissioners. Um, I, I wasn't at the meeting the whole time that meeting happened, but they approved it, and then I talked with each of the commissioners individually. Two of them initially wanted me to negotiate tying the building uh, to the funding. Uh, and when I emailed SOHS and explained that to them, then Alan DeBoer began calling people immediately. Uh, and uh, the, the Commissioner Bridenthal didn't agree with doing that. and. Uh, the other two commissioners essentially said that they didn't, you know, it, they could go either way on. So well, it, why, it was a. It why was wouldn't a, we? We can always forgive it later if it becomes a necessity. I just. Well, why wouldn't they? Uh, you know, think like a banker. You know, you get collateral, or you, or you demand certain changes be made. You just don't give money out. Don't disagree on that. Okay, enough on that. Let's move on. <laughs> okay, the next one is always a fun one, too. I want to talk about Expo funding. <laughs> um, Are you bringing all these? Tell me it's better than <laughs> this, this will be an issue in the budget targets as well. Uh, and I want to explain this. Um, every year that I've been here, and it's, not, it's, it's every board of commissioners for the eight years that I've been doing this job. Uh, well, this will tie in why. With, with the exception of one year. Uh, where Expo actually, where we, we actually, Harvey and I wrote a business plan for Expo and they actually profited 286000 which was the only year they've had a positive fund balance. Um, <clears throat> every other year, the Board of Commissioners and Budget Committee has directed that we are not going to give them any more money. Um, and they've instructed me to manage that so that we make sure that they don't come in and make requests, essentially telling them, hardlining with them that, uh, you know, that's it, we're not giving you any more money. And every year they come in and every year that they've wanted it, the Board of Commissioners have given them the money. So it's forced me to be the bad guy uh, and um, enforce all of these rules that then they come in and ask for them to be negated. And uh, if I thought things were going to be different, I, I wouldn't be recommending what I'm going to recommend here with Expo funding, but my guess is if this current Expo comes in this year and says we're $200,000 in the hole, we need $200,000, that they'll get $200,000, even though we said this is the last time. And honestly, seven of those eight years, every time we gave them money, the Board of Commissioners said this is the last time. So we've done that for seven of eight years. Uh, this last time, actually, Dick, the Board of Commissioners did ask the Budget Committee to come in for their meeting and took their input. Yep. And it was an off budget of expenditure between paying off the fund balance, funding their operations, and buying out the cell tower lease of about $700,000. That was last year. They currently have a positive fund balance somewhere around 300, 250, 300,000. Um, so I don't suspect they'll be in this year. 
although they did come in with a business plan and ask the board to provide, I think, $16 million in a bond obligation as well as all sorts of other funding for activities. The board has yet to discuss that, what they want to do with it. Um, <clears throat> so with Expo, essentially what I'm proposing in the budget is to set up a contingency in the general fund of $200,000 that can be made available to the fair and Expo if the board agrees to fund it. So it's not a direct appropriation to their budget. It's an appropriation in the general fund. It's a contingency. So that way, if the fair and Expo aren't managing according to what the board wants and comes in and asks for money, the board doesn't have to agree to give it to them. But if they are doing a good job and they just had a bad fare, for example, because there's 110 degree days every day and they just don't have the turnout they need, then the board could decide to uh, authorize the use of those funds. This way, there's something in the budget. This way, everyone knows the expectation is that they manage well, and if they don't, they're not getting the money if, even if they need it. But if they do manage well and they just have a bad, you know, bad luck, they can come in and ask the board to do it. Since I'm proposing it be set up in contingency, that means it requires a board order to be able to spend it. So they don't have free use of those funds. Uh, this kind of eliminates the fact that, I mean, honestly, we, we make rules every year and then we don't follow them. Uh, and we have the right, I mean, the Board of Commissioners has the right to do that. They can lead us in one direction, but essentially what happens is it becomes a big public you know, issue that you know the fair is in debt again, and they're asking the county for money, and the commissioners are saying they're not going to do it, and they need to be self-supporting, and then they're not self-supporting, and we go through this whole process every time it happens. <coughs> if you know, my my opinion is, if they continue with the uh, course of action they've taken, they should continue to build a positive fund balance, and they shouldn't need the money. Now, I'll tell you that I've heard some weird things from the fair board, different fair board members, like, hey, we need to take this fund balance we have and go buy a bulletin board for two hundred thousand bucks a digital bulletin board. Now, if they did something like that, I could see the board saying, hey, you went out and bought a digital bulletin board and spent your fund balance down, and now you want us to pay for your operations, so that doesn't make sense, right? So there's all of these things that they could decide to do, and some of them have talked about doing them, but this gives the board still the leverage of determining whether they believe uh, it's a good uh, investment of funds and management of uh, fiduciary uh, responsibilities. Along with that, in the 4-H district, I'm going to be proposing some amount, this is based on the <coughs> commissioners, that would go directly to their operating budget for the 4-H activities that they do. Um, I don't know what that amount is yet because we need to make sure that we uh, appropriately and adequately fund OSU extension within the district first and look at what the, those fund balances need to be. So. Uh, and that's open for discussion. I mean, this is where I started it, and I'm telling you the reasons why I did it. And it will be in the budget targets that we go over, but I wanted to separate it out because we've had discussions every year about this specifically, individually. Craig, you've uh, been awful quiet over there. I have. He's got smiles on his face. Hey, he's got smiles on his face. Though. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You well, have any I, words of wisdom at I, this I point? Think that, um, I've made my, my thoughts clear over the years about Expo and, and um, the fiscal responsibility that they've shown or not shown in terms of creating a balanced budget. I like the idea of uh, not um, planning on appropriating additional funds to them just on automatic pilot and setting and deciding a contingency because I think the reality that we just heard from from Danny is that the likelihood is is pretty um, strong that um, we'll have to dip into our pockets again if, if history repeats itself. So having a contingency I think is a good thing and it, and, it, and it kind of underscores the reality of what the situation is with funding Expo. So I, I, I think that's a good idea. Yeah. My thoughts are kind of along yours. I, I sure think there needs to be pressure uh, looking at you two guys, that you really need to resist the pressure to just fund their operating budget if they do something. Uh, I mean, we've, we've been through this so many times that, uh, and all the boards get phone calls from all the northern counties and all the cattle ranchers and pretty soon uh, 
they fold and they approve it and we Danny's tried the loan route and that doesn't seem to work because they got no way to repay their loan so if you're going to give them some money to, for their budget it just seems like you might as well appropriate it and give it to them because they're never going to pay anything back I think a lot of it I, I like this capital plan that you put together with the Parks Department mm -hmm. At this point, I think it would make us all feel better. Uh, you got to take five minutes, or you, you know what? I skipped capital projects update discussion, not on purpose, but oh. I, I need to go back to that. Could you talk about the in concept, your idea, what you've got in mind out I there? Uh, why I think this is a good good I'm, project. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to skip that. I, I guess I just got excited about the library district or something. You want to jump into the controversy? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't really think this is controversial. Uh, it, essentially, this started about a year and a half, two years ago, where I got approached by some members of the fair board um, saying that they had some interest in developing an RV park between the expo ponds on the north side of the expo property. Um, they had a private investor that was interested in it. Essentially, the private investor was going to offer them 3% of net, uh, which was ridiculous in my opinion. They were, they were interested in accepting it, I think, because they were interested in having any kind of revenue they could have. So they asked me to actually negotiate on their behalf uh, with this investor. And I negotiated this person up to 9% for anything over a million dollars in revenue, um, which for a private investment, Essentially, all he was doing was, you know, the, the fair wasn't doing anything. He was doing all of the investment work, management, and everything. The fair was, uh, you know, the fair board was agreeable to that amount. That deal fell through only because the fair didn't want to make additional property available to the investor, who wanted more property than just the expo ponds. Um, so, I started looking at the possibility of doing this in our parks department. Now, this is a whole process that's fairly technical. Um, first of all, everything out of the Expo Park is on Rural Residential 5. This is also <coughs> encumbered by Land and Water Conservation Fund requirements. The private investor, frankly, couldn't have got through those requirements to do what he wanted to do. Because Land and Water Conservation Funds require that the uh, property be used for outdoor activity. This person wanted to create a clubhouse, which is not outdoor activity, and all sorts of things on the property that wouldn't have qualified for use of the property would have required conversion, in other words, cash payouts with trading of properties with land and water conservation funds. Well, right? Yeah, and, and public access, so a private person couldn't stop the public from accessing it. So I started looking at those requirements, um, and essentially, uh, what I, so I went and talked to the fair board and said, hey, are you guys interested in this? Here's, here's what the process will be, which I'll explain. And they said, yeah, they were interested in having me pursue it on their behalf. Um, so the first thing that I want to do was a pro forma. So I did a pro forma that showed, you know, 35% occupancy, 40%, 50% over a 10-year period. Made projections on operating expenses and revenue and showed how this thing pencils out uh, to, to make money pretty significantly for our park system, which RV uh, spaces and campgrounds are something our park system's really good at. That's where our park system excels and, and actually funds those parks that Commissioner Rasher talked about that don't fund themselves. Um, so the first thing I did was set out to see if we can get it qualified for a one-time non-conforming use. The reason why we can do that on this property is because there is a master plan that was adopted by the board in the 70s that show it as an RV park. Otherwise, we wouldn't have the opportunity to do that. So good thinking back then. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it was the 80s. It was a long time ago. Uh, I remember I went to court and testified on it, and it was archaic. Uh, but um, good that it's there. So we have, we have your time frame is different. The point of reference. The, the, the paper was moldy. <laughs> You're losing some of us. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Hey, baby, don't worry. Rick and I are with you. <laughs> hey, I was born in the '70s. I mean, if it was the '60s. Oh, we're in my prime in the 80s. <laughs> what do you mean? You're still okay, in your prime. Right. <laughs> let, let me go ahead. Um, <laughs> so essentially what I wanted to, what I told the what I told the fair board was look, if we can't even qualify this through the land use process, there's no use in us pursuing this. But I'm not willing to go spend the money in our parks department to see if we can qualify through the land use process 
unless you guys are going to agree that you're going to claim the property surplus. In other words, you're not going to own you're not going to own the right to manage the property anymore. The county owns all the property out there. State law allows them to manage that property unless they claim a surplus. If they claim a surplus, it comes back to the general fund and the county manages it again. You know, I'm not trying to strong arm them on this. The reason why I said that is because once they claim it surplus, which I don't want them to do until we get the approval through the land use process, otherwise it's you know irrelevant. We wouldn't want the property. Then the board can accept the property, and then the board can designate the property as a county park. The reason why I want them to do that is because when it qualifies as a county park, we get a thousand dollars per year or per month for every spot that we have that's an RV parking spot through RV uh, title and registration fees. So we have an instant operating revenue that a private company wouldn't have and that the fair couldn't have because they're not the county parks, they're a hmm. separate department. So my thought was um, to have them claim it surplus once we get the approval. We've applied for the approval and we're waiting for that. Um, and, and you know, it's a good chance we'll get it. The, the key factor, we had to go to ODOT for transportation system impacts and we had to negotiate with right ways with utilities and easements and all of those kinds of things. But, and on all that's been done, uh, the key issue was that the traffic impact can't be any more than the highest day of traffic out at, out at that location. And so, we don't think it will be. In fact, we provided evidence that it won't because the fare is the, obviously the highest traffic and we're not going to have that many people coming to an RV park. So that was kind of the, the hurdle to get over and I think we've, we've been able to do that. Of course, any approval will be a tentative approval, it can be appealed, all of those things can happen to us just like they happen to anyone else, and we'll go through that process. So this could be a short process, or it could become a long process if we get into all of those kinds of uh, issues. Um, so my concept was then to have the parks borrow money from the general fund to fund this, which is $2.8 million. The parks doesn't have, a, doesn't have a fund balance large enough to fund it themselves. Um, we'll set that up on a five-year payback because Oregon law allows for capital improvements, one fund to make a loan to another fund for up to five years. For operating expenses, it's one year. Actually, it's the current year, not even one year. It's the current fiscal year. Um, they won't pay it back at five years if the pro forma that we uh, developed that only showed a 35% occupancy in year one and up to a 50% occupancy in year 10. Now, I way undershot that on purpose. I wanted to be as conservative as possible so that um, it didn't under uh, deliver on the project. My guess is we'll, we'll come close to 50% in the first year. That changes the payback period. But we'll make the loan for five years at the end, and we'll, we'll have a minimum base payment of 250000 a year for those five years, depending on what their occupancy is and what they net. And then uh, at the end of five years, we'll reissue the loan for another five years if that's what we need to do. We're allowed to do that. So um, at 250000 a year, it would take about 11 years to pay it back if all they do is that lower end of occupancy. Now, you know, I, I have all of the financial information that supports all of this. I didn't bring that today. It's pretty, it's into pretty complicated stuff. But essentially, um, we need to go back and negotiate with parks, but I'm going to propose that any of the revenue that's generated from this, uh, of the revenue that's generated, 20% will go to net, 20% will go to the parks, and 80% will go to, uh, I'm sorry, 20% will go to the expo, 80% will go to parks. Parks is building it, parks is managing it, parks is running it. The fair and expo couldn't do this without parks. There's no way that they could qualify for the operating revenue that parks can qualify for. And honestly, they don't have the technical ability to do everything I'm telling you that we're doing right now. Um, so my guess is that they'll want more because they typically want more if it's the county. They were willing to take 3% from a private investor <laughs> and up to 9% that I negotiated and I'm offering them 20% but my guess is they'll probably say they want 50%. Yeah. Uh, maybe not but you know it'll be a negotiation. Right. And I'll get the, you know, all of these things that I do I go and talk to the board about, we talk about them most well, many times an executive session before a project becomes because it's a real property transaction and it qualifies under executive session. This is public now, the application submitted, there's been public discussions about it. But essentially all of these things I'm telling you, I went to the board and said, here's what I would like to do, are you okay with this or not, and then we move forward. Who's, who's the customer? Who, who, people come off the freeway? Yeah. Who, who uses people it? People who use the fare. 
will. People who come off the freeway will. It's going to be a very nice park. Um, it will it will uh, accommodate the great big rigs that you know you see traveling down the highway. Um, full hookups. You know. Uh, there is huge demand for that. Oh yes. So I'm an RVer. Yes. I'll, I'll like that too. Please. The, uh, the, uh, the second busiest uh, RV park and uh, state park in the state of Oregon is Valley of the Road. <laughs> the first one's over there at Astoria. Uh, but, uh, and it's full uh, during the summertime. You have to try to try to get reservations. That, and it's not going to be as nice as this park here is going to be. I mean, this park is going to be nicer than Valley Road. Valley Road's nice, it's large. Mm -hmm. But with the ponds and such, people along on the freeway, once our beers traveling, especially from BC in Washington down to the mm -hmm. desert, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. vice versa. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're looking for places to go because Med Medford's a good halfway okay. spot. Okay. So, and then just the normal tourism during the summertime. But uh, I just think this is, boy, this is a slam dunk. This is uh, going to be, in fact, I expect you guys to expand it years down the road. So I got a spike place to park. So. At a 50% <laughs> occupancy by year 10, we should be netting over a million dollars a year. In revenue, so two hundred thousand dollars roughly to Expo, eight hundred thousand dollars to parks, and the loan will be paid back. Yeah. Assuming we got a if we get a fifty percent occupancy rate up, up front, the loan will be paid back before ten years. Take about eight years to pay it back. Yes, yeah. and that's a good continuing revenue. Yeah, it goes yeah. on forever. Yeah. Yeah. Forever. forever. That's it. And that's yeah. a good bigger. investment, I think. I think that's work well done if you yeah. bring it off. Well, I think we will, but it's just a process. And you know, uh, the thing that's made this most difficult is the Land and Water Conservation Fund rules because, you know, the property was acquired with grants from Land and Water Conservation Funds, and they, the, the rules are, are harsh. And private developers, they buy a piece of land to build the hotel on it. It doesn't have all of these kind of restrictions and encumbrances. We have to create public access around the pond still, which we will in the, de in the design. The private investor was proposing to squeeze 175 spots in, in that little area which would have made it very difficult to get some of the larger RVs. We're down in the 90s, so we almost cut it in half. So room for people to pull through and big rigs to get in and out. Uh, it will accommodate all ranges. I mean, even tenters will be accommodated up through, um, you know, big rigs. You know, for a little background for the new board members, the Parks Department is a real success story in my opinion. They used to take around $300,000 of general fund support. Two million at the peak. At the peak mm -hmm. to make their budget. And we told them our, uh, one of our spending uh, strategic priorities is you don't make the cut, but you know it's important to have parks, but you've got to figure out a way to break even at, at the minimum. And over the years, they have really went to work and they're guy running the parks and it's under roads and John Dial, between those two guys, they are really good operators. And I have a high confidence level that they'll 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 run that park well and it'll run at the higher numbers, not the lower numbers. And so the parks are really, you know, they can perform and they'll uh, make it happen. I only promise the lower numbers big. Just so you know, but I agree with you. I'm already spending the high number. <laughs> okay, um, while we're on capital projects, um, I kind of talked a little bit about the Justice Court already. I don't know if you have any questions about that. I talked about the budget for it, 1.5, which is already budgeted, not additional funds. And then the DA's office, uh, essentially what the DA's office we're planning on doing is just to the west, the west the parking lot. We have a parking lot that the city required us to build when we built the juvenile detention center two blocks away that never has anyone parked it. I mean, I'm not kidding. You could drive over there today and there's no one there. Our plan is to build the new facility on that site and then take the old buildings out and make that the parking. Um, so we already own the property. We don't have a property expense. Uh, we will have, obviously, you know, demolition expenses, but all that will be all that's included in the 6.2 <coughs> facility. And uh, as I said, you know, I've talked with the board about this, telling them once we get the design complete, we'll bring it back. And I am going to recommend that we fund it this year. Mm -hmm. That will carry into next year. Um, but uh, because we've underspent our budget, because we budgeted to pay for libraries and we budgeted to pay for extension, then we have the funds available without really affecting, dipping into the fund balance we projected. 
affects the ending fund balance in the end no matter what, but you know, not in the current year. So the, the this is a, kind of a necessary replacement, right? The way you'd classify it? Yeah, I think if you, you know, they, they've had some pretty significant issues over there. Those buildings were not designed for any kind of public safety function. They were developed, I think, for insurance sales. And they have, you know, glass windows. And you guys, I mean, essentially what started this process was the bombing over there uh, where someone made a homemade bomb, set it through the window, and um, the, the feds came down. They flew in on their jet and did an inspection. They took the guy to federal court and sentenced him, I think, to 17 years or something like that. But uh, they have all sorts of um, issues with people who come to the DA's office. They also have issues with being able to hold grand jury and accommodate victims in a confidential way. So, and you know, they do grand jury all the time because that's how they indict people. Um, they're really short on office space. I mean, if you go over there, they're just all crammed in by cubicles. Um, and so that was the reason why we added, you know, at the direction of the board, we added the, con uh, the conceptual uh, design funding in this current year's budget. John? Well, I want to make a comment for incoming commissioners or maybe the budget committee. If you go over there, uh, it seems like we were doing a lot of capital projects recently, but if you go to that facility, they have files stacked in the hallways. Some of the doors won't open all the way to get into an office because they've got files behind them. I mean, they are really crammed in there, and you don't realize it until you, you take a walk through there and you, you understand. Fire marshal wouldn't be very happy no, about no, that. No, they would be <laughs> happy with them. Yeah. Those are the. I'm going to talk about one other capital Let's project. Have a question. For you. I have a question, real quick. Um, you mentioned that the Justice Building is basically coming out of this year's budget. It's already budgeted. It's year. budgeted in this current fiscal cycle, and you have it down here as a 1516 impact on an expenditure. Um, is how is that going to impact next year's budget? Is it because it's a carryover? Is this going to be there? Yeah, but you're, you're, uh, yeah, you're showing that is we're going to have to pull it out of next year's budget kind of the way I interpret the sheet you gave us. Yeah. The same as the expo. Because we won't spend it all this year. I mean, you know, we won't get, we won't have, we're, we're just in the process. We budgeted to spend it this year, but we won't spend it. It's going to be the same thing with the DA's office. So it'll be part of the carryover. It'll be a, it'll, yeah, it'll be a carryover expense, but it will affect our fund balance, right? Because accounting wise, right. we have to say we didn't spend that and it'll become fund balance. Right. But we'll also account for the fact that we budgeted it and we're going to spend it next year by having it as a carryover. So and, and, and that way everybody else understands what reality is. Yeah. The purpose of this sheet was basically just to show what the unencumbered grand yeah. day balance would be. So if we approve these At expenditures the the on there, then they'll come forward in the next year that they'll be encumbered. And set aside that project. So and I was telling you, someplace between 19, and, and also 30 million or 20 million, 25. And, and also, that is just a rough, rough estimate right now. But let me just say, <coughs> there's a lot that will happen in the next six months. So I'm giving you the best rough estimate I can give. Um, just, I, oh, I'm sorry. Just uh, on all this, just to maintain clarity on this, everybody knows, especially if the new commissioner is coming in, there's no bonding. There's no levies that are being asked for in this process, so we're not going to the voters for any type of uh, increase in revenue. Uh, so everybody is clear on that. Yeah. Okay, and I do have one more that I'll talk about in executive session. Um, so I'm going to jump back. Um, Expo funding, I think we're done on. You want me to talk about the RV park? You missed the one. Uh, I'm going to talk, talk about another one in executive session. Well, that one. Executive. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Can I ask you one question before you go back? I noticed activity on that lot where you tore the church down. Huh? What's going on there? It's being paid for parking. That was in this year's budget. <coughs> oh, that's being paid for parking. Huh? Who's parking that? Justice, the people there. The Justice Court and elections. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. The, okay. You know, we we in the future we can use that for <coughs> a facility. I mean, it's zoned because the church was there appropriately. Right. But yeah, it's paid, and it's not the it's. Uh, there's two two different lots there, uh, and it's not all of it that we're paying. But yeah, I, I just saw it. activity on it. That, that, that actually was in this year's capital projects budget yeah, that I went over. I don't have a problem on this year. Didn't all of it. Um, PERS update. So you have a sheet right here. Looks like this. Google PERS. 
And essentially, uh, we look good with purse, our purse rates. But I'm going to have Harvey go over this with you real quick while I run to the restroom. Because the market's doing well. Well, actually, um, so if you look at the, the back side of it, it looks like this. Okay, so what, what I'm showing you here is um, what happened to us as we set the budget for this current fiscal year, um, as they normally do. I mean, they gave us the rates that they were going to be charging us, and so we budgeted a certain rate, and I've got that in the, the first column there with the numbers. You can see uh, Tier 1, Tier 2 under general service, 16.01%, uh, and then you have the 6%, so 22.01%. Um, and then the legislature got a hold of it, um, the governor made his run at it, and basically they saved us 4.4%, uh, and that's 4.4% of salary. Okay. So um, basically what happened is we already had the numbers in our labor forecast system for the budget, and that's what we budgeted for this year. But then they came in and the amount that they're actually charging us is shown in that next column. Okay, so there was a, a good savings. And then we didn't ever go back and adjust. We took that money out of the department's budgets. We just basically left it in there as a projection. Um, and then if you turn it over... Harvey, is this yes. encumbered by the lawsuit that's yes. in going yes. on to? Yes. So it could go away or not? It's, yeah, something could happen to that. Okay. Got that amount of money. Are, we kind of, are we leaving that in those budgets and letting them carry forward in case that lawsuit goes south? We're, we're letting them Basically, it'll be in their budgets right now, but they're not spending it because we're not spending it. Um, and that'll carry forward into the next year and the beginning of the balance. So, I was going to explain this when he was done explaining the rates. But essentially, you, you remember that with the purse reductions that we got the year before last, but or the year before this year, so this fiscal year, last fiscal year, we um, estimated that we would underspend the general fund portion by $1.8 based on what we budgeted. That was the same for dedicated funds because they're about 50-50. Um, what happens in the dedicated funds is that just becomes fund balance. So when you say, are we leaving it in their budget, it's in their fund balance. Um, in the general fund, it becomes part of the general fund fund balance. So we don't leave it in a department's budget, but it's in the general fund fund balance. Uh, and I was going to wait until we get to budget targets to talk about it, but since you're asking the questions now, um, you know, essentially, we depending on what happens with the Supreme Court on in the ruling on this, we could have an obligation of close to four million bucks to the general fund, four million dollars to the dedicated funds. All of those funds would pay their own cost. The general fund depends on what happens with PERS and what they decide to do. They could assess that in rates, or we could pay it. And we could take fund balance and pay it. So. Those are things I was going to talk about when I got to the budget targets as potential things that kind of linger out there right now. Uh, but really what I wanted <coughs> you to see was just, you know, we did pretty well with PERS overall compared to what we were talking about two years ago and three years ago. And then if, if you look at the front page, what I've done for you there is just compared um, what our rates are going to be in uh, 15 and 16 compared to what was actually budgeted this year and then what we were actually charged is on the, on the part that's lower than that. So you can see that um, actually for if you compare budget this year to what we're setting up in the later forecast for next year, there's actually a, a reduction in all of the rates. Okay? But then if you look at what's actually being charged, um, then we're going up a little bit. For example, in the Tier 1, Tier 2 general service, then they're going to charges more this next year than you're charging this next year. So why don't you just be able to see that difference all as well? That that legislation that gave us the break for this uh, for the PERS that you just mentioned, um, it's my understanding that there's some kind of something that's set back a few years that's gonna have to be obligated back into the system. Do you are you familiar with anything? Am I speaking on a different subject or it was basically it's kind of, it's a kind temporary of a, reduction type thing. It, um, I know it's really complicated. I, I mean, yeah, I, I kind of went over what all those 
changes were a couple of years ago, but mm -hmm. I don't know which one you're, I mean, unless you have more specificity. I'm that could trying to remember if there's going to be something in the future in a few years down the road where we're going to lose some money back to PERS based on some of these changes. Well, if these things are overturned by the Supreme Court, we're going to owe money back to PERS yeah, for the last couple of years. Of this was actually part of the, the uh, legislation, not the litigation. Well, that's what I'm talking about. The litiga litiga uh, the legislation changed it, <coughs> and they asked that it be referred directly to the Supreme Court, and they took that case, yeah. and that's what we're waiting for. But, but the PERS is still budgeting an 8% return in the market, aren't they? It, it's it's a different. They're guaranteeing that for the tier one. Tier yeah, one. only tier, tier one. It's only tier, tier one. one. Yeah. And only the employer the employer contribution. Mm -hmm. of the <coughs> and when do the we see the success of the stock market of helping us? Well, it's helping us now because okay. the unfunded actuarial liability right. was so okay. huge. Okay. If it wasn't, our rates would be going. This is helping right. us. Remember, we were yes. jumping four percent earlier. Yeah. 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 So it's helping us now. It's just not. But when it's, we have our next decline, we're going to have real trouble. This this Potential. next year, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll have a there's a requirement on our audit to report our uh, unfunded actuarial liability for every local government. And it's not something we've done before, and we couldn't even compute it. PERS has to compute it. So there was legislation passed allowing PERS to compute this for us. They're going to charge us for it. <laughs> um, but our unfunded actuarial liability two years ago was $60 million. So, you know, but every government has an unfunded actuarial liability proportionate. Ours is going to be less because we have a side account, but just slightly less than proportionally another government our size would be. And it also depends on the mix of employees you have. So how many tier one, how many tier two, how many officer. Um, and uh, essentially, I think, um, well, I mean, that's kind of explained. What is our general mix of employees? At our, I mean, the 3.5 to how? In the I think we were about 50-50 last time mm -hmm. that I looked. Okay. The tier one and tier two are leaving. Yeah. Well, yeah, but they're living long. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Some of them are younger than you think. <laughs> do, you, do you want to take a break before we get to the budget targets? Yeah, I yeah. think it'd be appropriate. Okay, how about so, like 10 minutes? Yeah, the uh, Ken Tail. Uh, yeah. Next, we'll talk about an executive session. Uh, but this will generally set the direction for budget targets. Uh, essentially, Start off by saying that I projected um, an increase uh, in the budget targets of 3.5 percent, and an increase in revenue funds of 1.5 percent. So the Justice Court, the clerks. Um, this is the same format that I've used every year that we've refined to this based on the budget committee's requests. The the revenues will be on the back, but I'm going to start here with the expenditures on the front. Um, what you look at is the current budgeted is the first column. And then adjustments will be if we're adding anything or taking anything away. Now, um, when we're taking things away, essentially they were one-time carryovers that we back out because we don't want to add a CPI to a one-time carryover that we included in the budget. So for the assessor's office, then the CPI change is the budgeted amount plus the 3.5% for the total budget target. I am, we have not provided a cost of living raise the last two years. I am proposing, now we have three unions and a management and confidential employees group. For the management and confidential employees group, I'm proposing a 1.76% CPI adjustment. This is the overall budget target of 3.5%. I'm talking about payroll expenses at one point seven six. That is what the CPI is, so we won't catch up anything that we fell behind to the comparables, we'll just uh, make the adjustment for CPI. Now the unions will be different. One of the unions I'll talk about in executive session, and the other two, they're set by contract, um, and we make estimates, but they're estimates because I can't give you a CPI if the contract's based on today because it's not based on this time period. Uh, Board of Commissioners, this is their whole general fund budget, uh, $45,219. They're funded mostly through indirect charges to departments. Um, so, you know, that you just see they add the 
Danny, would you take a moment and explain, uh, expand on that just slightly for the two new commissioners so they so they would understand what you're saying on where the dollars come from now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've kind of explained this a couple of times in the past, but um, essentially the Board of Commissioners are overhead uh, in terms of finances, how they're funded. Um, so they're funded through indirect cost allocation. And, you know, if you look at their agenda, they'll do work for Health and Human Services. That work they do gets charged to Health and Human Services. Um, they'll do work for the Sheriff's Office. That work will get charged to the Sheriff's Office. So there is more general fund that supports the, the, the commissioners than their direct budget, but that comes from general fund departments. So the Sheriff's Department is the largest general fund department. They'll make the largest indirect payment for the cost of the commissioners. Commissioners uh, roughly are funded about 50% from the general fund overall when you account for indirect charges and 50% through dedicated funds. So for example, if you stopped uh, providing the dedicated fund services, the burden of cost would fall off where those dedicated funds come from and fall all on the general fund to our local taxpayers. Um, so when we get FAA grant assurances for the airport, um, that's not a direct local property tax that's funding commissioners is the federal uh, <coughs> appropriation. If you take that away, then what that used to pay for commissioners overhead now becomes a local property tax uh, burden. So is there anything else you want me to explain, Doug? No, I just okay. let everybody understand how that's funded. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the clerks, uh, you see we budgeted a, an income from them of 13747 of the general fund. As I said, I projected a 1.5% increase. Uh, community justice, um, most of their general fund goes towards juvenile services, not the adult side of the plan because the adult side of the plan is, comes from dedicated funds from the state, most of it. Uh, the, the juvenile side is a county mandated function. The level of the function is discretionary, but um, we backed out the 422,000, which was a carryover from the uh, previous year, uh, which we didn't want to add a CPI to, as I stated earlier. So after we backed that out and adjust the CPI, you see their budget target. Uh, county Council, I'm sorry, yeah, County Council, just that's a straightforward one. <coughs> um, county Administration, uh, we have audited, well, I guess, let's see, the first Four, pretty straightforward. Um, current budget of plus of 3.5. Uh, when we get down to economic and special development, that 102 is the total we spend uh, on everything we do in economic and special development. As I said earlier, 26,000 of that goes to So Ready. <coughs> that 23,914 we're backing out is Taylor Grazing. And um, that was a carryover from the previous year, and so we add the 3.5 to the balance of that. So it's budgeted, less the adjustment, plus the COLA gives the total. And then you see I added in the two lines that I already discussed with you about economic development. I didn't increase those 3.5. No, just a quick question. Earlier you mentioned that the um, lottery funds that we get, about the $800,000 you ever take lottery funds for economic development will be uh, allocated for the Sheriff's Department? No, that's not what I said. Or they're not, no, hold on. I said that we'll account for them that's okay, as account. we report to the state against the sheriff's department. That's different. They're general fund dollars. Right. They're in the general fund. It's just a reporting requirement that we tell the state where we spent that portion of our general fund. I, I guess what I'm asking is in doing it to the sheriff's department or, would it, or doing it toward these economic and special development stuff that we're doing? It's all general fund. It really doesn't matter. It's all general fund. Okay. The only thing is that we have to report that we're spending in there. It, I guess what, it, it, what I'm asking is it ease up the reporting process no. to do it that way or something. No. Let me let me just say this. Almost everything the county does qualifies as economic development. So it really the reason why we went to the sheriff's office is it's the biggest general fund budget we have. So um, <clears throat> OSU extension, you see we zeroed them out. That's because the district. And then the water master's office. Now the state funds the water master, we fund the uh, 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 technicians, two of them. 
Um, so the, you see the CPI adjustment there. Development services, we backed out the, um, that 84,000 was for their software project that we allowed them to carry over the money for last year. And then added the CPI adjustment to their budget. So essentially the county subsidizing development in our community for two and a half million bucks. That was up as high as 1.2 million. Um, so that's, that's backing off. Um, and I, I, I suspect it will continue to back off if we continue to see more development in the community. Unless, of course, the Board of Commissioners decide they want to take all taxpayer money and fund development projects for, you know, individuals. Because that's essentially what this does, is it subsidizes developers. Um, <clears throat> the district attorney, this is where I made a big, a, a significant change over what I would normally be here recommending to you. And this is the first year where I've added anything back to the budget, and I'll explain why once we get to the end of this. But this 160000 that you see as an adjustment is an addition of general fund revenue. That's to add back the district attorney that they cut two years ago. That district attorney, you'll recall, Beth said that she was having them primarily stopping prosecuting meth, amphetamine, cocaine, heroin, residue. <coughs> um, marijuana isn't included in those because you can have less than an ounce of marijuana. It's a violation. So we're talking about the hard drugs that they stopped prosecuting residue cases on. That's impacted her more because her filings have went up. Um, and she came to the Public Safety Coordinating Council, which is the advisory body to the Board of Commissioners, and she requested the Public Safety Advisory Body of the Board of Commissioners. She requested that they support a request from her to add that position back uh, for this, but also for um, high-tech crimes, so the investigation of you know, child pornography and those types of things um, that they cut back as well as a result of the loss of that position. And that's what they would dedicate that person's time back to. The, it may not be that person gets assigned those specific cases, but the additional staff time will go towards those types of cases. Uh, yeah, can I ask a question on that? Um, Oh, when you said that uh, that Beth was going to uh, recommend that, what's the procedure for that? I mean, yeah. you've mentioned it to me. Would it go to Don because he's yeah. a liaison? No, no, I'm, I'm going to get there. Oh, you are? I, oh. I wasn't done yet oh, explaining. Okay. Right. Um, so as I was saying, Beth went to the PSCC. They voted to support the request, and she drafts a letter and submits it to the Board of Commissioners. Oh. Now, that's an advisory body of the Board of Commissioners, not to the Budget Committee. Um, but based on the fact that the budget committee's priorities, based on budget policies, is public safety as the number one priority, and she's saying that that cut is impacting her ability to prosecute cases, I'm recommending this is where you put the money. The 160000 isn't the cost of the position. The cost of the position is about 130, but the 30 are for overhead charges, the additional 30000 to the 160000 And the 130000 is not what someone gets paid. Uh, that includes all, uh, all costs. Uh, yeah, payroll costs. Um, so we add that, and then uh, the CPI brings her budget target to four million seventy thousand. Now, if you guys want to tell me that you don't want me to include that in the budget, this would be a good time to tell me. If you know that, if you don't know that and want to wait till you get to the hearings process, that's fine too. Well, that was my point. I, I, haven't seen a re I haven't seen that request. Well, I know you haven't seen it, but I'm telling you that it was made because okay. Commissioner Reinthal is assigned to the PSCC. Oh, I'm you are. I'm sorry. By your ordinance. We were both there for it. Okay. He, he was actually there when this happened as well. And so, you know, essentially when I know that something's, all of this stuff you haven't seen written request for it, John. I mean, essentially when I know something's coming, I put it in the budget. Right. Well, I just didn't know if this was part of the process, and I'm not opposed to it. I just, I'm trying to get a clarification on what the process is. What All this is is a budget target. That's it. You're not approving the position right now. Okay. I'm telling you why I included it in the budget target. If you don't like that, you can tell me no, why I included no it in the budget target. Determining whether or not you want to adopt that will be part of your public hearing process. And when the DA comes into the public hearing, 
she'll certainly explain to you why she needs this position and what the PSCC said. And <coughs> she'll have a letter that is written by them that she'll submit. And what's the P? Public Safety, Public Safety Coordinating, Coordinating Council. Council. Yeah, I'm and sorry. who is that? It's a council. Uh, it's a statutory committee that also the board adopted an ordinance with. The board enhanced the membership of the committee and created site committee to the Public Safety Coordinating Council. It's effectively a result of the Community Corrections Partnership Act of 1993 and um, essentially created these local councils to advise the governing body of the county on public safety issues. It includes key members that are statutory members like a chief of police that's selected from all of the chiefs of police in the county, a mayor who's selected from all of the mayors in the county. Chief Justice. Uh, uh, well, uh, uh, the judge, judge, the, judge. the, the uh, presiding judge. So they, would, uh, they would never say, don't add somebody. They no, there's actually six lay members as well. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. okay That's done you. by ordinance as well. I mean, I, I wasn't through the whole list. I'm telling you, there are statutory requirements for who's on it, and it does include a statutory requirement for lay members, not six. The board enhanced that, as I said. They, they wanted more lay uh, uh, membership uh, input. The district attorney, uh, state police is represented, but they're a non-voting member. The county administrator, and I'm only there because of the county's ordinance, or else I wouldn't have to be there. The community corrections director, the juvenile director, who in our <coughs> county is the same person. Uh, so it goes on. There's a list of who they are. And if you actually want a list of the membership of the committee, I can get it to you. It's a, it's a good way to discuss what's working, what's not working, and how to uh, recommend adjustments into our uh, public safety system in the county. And it has enough bright minds that they can speak to each of the different areas. Mm -hmm. and when you do it. I somehow came away last time thinking that she said, eh, it's no big deal, I don't have this person. I, I came away with that feeling last time. Well, you may yeah, you have felt that way, but I mean, that's not what she said. Okay. Yeah. okay. I mean, I, you know, I, I don't want to speak for her, I'm just telling right. you what, what happened. Uh, what what instigated me including this in the budget target? I'll tell you now or hold our peace, and I'm just trying to determine which I want to do. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm gonna I'm gonna say this: the things that I include, there's some other things that I included in here, and I'm gonna say that I thought that it was important to make sure that we have stability in the services we deliver before we're spending money on other things, and so. My, my thought was, okay, if I don't include them in these departments like Beth struggle to prosecute cases, right. but we're giving a million dollars over three years to economic development, that doesn't make any sense to me. But that's a policy decision. But I'm telling you why I included it in the budget. And that's why I included other increases that I included that I'll discuss is because there's some departments that have really struggled to shore up their services. And they are general fund departments. That's where their funding comes from. So. And uh, if you decide you don't want to spend that money there, you don't have to. And the, 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 the consequence of that is not prosecuting certain cases, which we've done for the last couple of years. And it's building. It's building partially because the number of cases coming to the DA's office right. is increasing. And that's increasing because the number of Medford police officers are increasing, essentially. So there's, you know, it's a system. And anytime you do something to one place in the system, it impact, impacts the system all the way through. It impacts the filings at the court, and it impacts the number, impacts the number of trials, the number of uh, uh, pleas, plea bargains. It impacts the number of cases the DA have. It impacts the amount of grand jury time we have. I mean, so uh, that's what's going on. And that's what it is. It's frustrating that, uh, that we have to pay for this because we don't prosecute on behalf of the county but the DA prosecutes on behalf of the state. This is part of those frustration pieces that we pay for, which sometimes the state should be picking them up. But reality is, like Andy was saying, is and we're seeing a lot more in increase in the workload. Um, that's different than what it was last year, so things have modified. And Andy did a good job explaining that, and as we go into the future, I expect it to see it to increase some more because of the fact that you, as communities try to put uh, law enforcement into, into play and because they're having problems, uh, this is, the, this is the, the secondary effect of all this. But we are prosecuting and keeping them in jail. 
Yeah, yeah our force yeah, releases have went way down releasing because releasing yeah, force releases have been way yeah. down. We'll, we'll, we'll talk okay, about that you. when I get to yeah, that. The okay. added jail beds have really helped okay. when I get to the sheriff's office. Um, I'm going to move on past that. That 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 will ultimately be a decision of the budget committee. I'm just telling you why I included it in the budget target. It, 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 you asked the question: Should you leave it in? It's my it's my recommendation, sitting on the PSAC, that you leave it in this and bring it forward because of the caseload. There's such that it is. This isn't setting the budget. No, it's, it's just, just setting the discussion. Yeah, just a placeholder for conversation. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. And I, I think it should be left in yeah. place. And I don't want to not budget it because yeah, this is then a it's a discussion about the drivers in the budget. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's a high-level discussion about what we want. Basically, it's a philosophy in the budget. Yeah. Now, if you wanted to argue a little bit, you could argue by 3.5. That's what he wants to know. Are we pretty much in agreement with an overall 3.5? Let me get to the end before you answer that question. <laughs> yeah, I'm just saying that those are the way my mind works on this is the overall yeah, I agree. Don't get into the minutia and just stay high with it. Yeah. Re get, remember that the, too far into the, it. the roll up cost for current service level for for <laughs> all of the county thing services right we deliver is actually about seven a little over seven percent a year. So when we increase the budget target of three point five, that means the department's still cutting because their costs are actually going up on average, it costs all funds seven percent a year. Right. I'm saying that because there's there's yeah. some new people here that need to hear some things. We've had multiple years of very lean budget targets. I think we went 1% last year. And what that means is we just keep cutting, which is fine. We can do that. Uh, and that's essentially <clears throat> rolls out to staff because our, our the majority of our general fund costs are staff. Uh, the next one, I put it in Expo's line, but it's not going to be in Expo's budget. It's going to be a general fund contingency. That's why the note's there. That's the 200000 that I just talked to you about. That's another thing that I think we need to shore up, not because, just because of what practice has been. So that's why I included it. That's carried in the fiduciary account? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, finance is pretty straightforward. Uh, health and Human Services is a place So Health and Human Services is another place where I made a big change. Uh, their general fund target I just added the 3% to, 3.5, but you'll see the second line all the way out to the right, 287000 mm -hmm. We have an operating deficit in the animal shelter of $400,000 a year. Now the Board of Commissioners have done a lot of things to try to close that operating gap um, in terms of fees and those types of things. Um, what I'm and how we've been how we've been funding that four hundred thousand dollar gap is through it's called a BB fund. It was a trust made to right. the animal shelter, and it's spent down. It's being spent down. Two more years at four hundred thousand a year, and we're out of money there. Um, and essentially, um, you, there's a couple of options here. This two hundred eighty-seven thousand. I'll tell you where it comes from when we get to revenues. But this covers the biggest portion of that four hundred thousand, and I think over that makes the BB fund available for you know ten years to support that operating deficit. And I think over that period of time, we can develop ways to fund the, the balance. Um, now, I've said this multiple times, and I'm going to say it to the new commissioners who are here today: the most political issue on our budget is the animal shelter. You may not believe me when I tell you this, but you will be burnt and crucified over the animal shelter for the, the, the mo for, you know, for what I would say are ridiculous things. But to some people, they're very, very important. And in this case, we, we have animal shelter services that include servicing felines, cats. We're not required to do that. So if you want to close the operating gap, we can stop receiving cats. We can stop taking cats. The only thing that we're required to do in statute is manage dogs. We would still have a shelter, but we can severely cut back on our operating budget if we don't manage cats. 
if you want to continue to manage, and I can tell you this, if you decide that you don't want to manage cats, there will be hundreds of people marching in to let you know that they don't agree with that, and they'll probably keep doing it over and over, and they'll probably write letters, and you'll probably hear about it in the newspaper and on the television stations. And we have the largest feral cat population out there. <laughs> it's amazing how many feral cats we have. Um, I, I'll be honest with you, some days at the shelter we take in 50 cats a day. Wow. Yeah, it's huge. So uh, if you decided to do away, now, now those are peak days, but they happen, and they happen frequently. Uh, if you decide to take that away from the public, I, I would assume that there'll be pretty significant outcry. You may want to do that. That's your choice. It's a policy decision. And if that's what you want to do, then I won't recommend that we fund it. But the alternative to funding of a general fund is increasing fees significantly, like doubling them. And I'm assuming that commissioners don't want to do that. So, But you could choose to do that as well. When you say substantial, how much would it reduce that operating deficit by by uh, eliminating cats from the equation, or do you have an estimate? Well, I haven't done uh, I haven't done a full projection, but I'm pretty sure we would cover the operating deficit at least. Cats are expensive, and people people use the shelter to pick up their the uh, that population out there that doesn't belong to anybody, and they use it as a dumping ground. They collect up and then they dump it at the shelter. That's why we put that fee in place here recently at ten dollars. So you're, we're just not taking care of the fair, fair cat population. People have to take some responsibility for it. So it's uh, there's a people don't spay and neuter, but as a result, they just go out of control. Cats are very prolific, so. And the cats group didn't pick up the slack, or are they not functioning they're just, as well? No, they're 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 at peak performance. All the uh, the other private shelters right now for cats and everything are just running. A, a the the difference load. is those shelters don't have to take feral cats. They get to decide what they take. Wow. We don't. Okay. We have to take everything. So when you go to Southern Humane, Oregon Humane, <coughs> they don't take cats that they can't adopt. Mm -hmm. We have to take everything. So we have a different standard that we have to comply with. And then impacts us hugely. So I included that, once again, discussion point. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll explain when we get to the revenues why I included that amount. Uh, human services agencies, another big issue that typically gets discussed here. This would be a good one that if you guys have a, a better direction, but essentially I took what we budgeted, I backed out the one-time additional funding that you had a vote to add back to the budget increased it the base by 3.5% to $333,326. Can be just a starting point for discussion, but if you think and you want to do something bigger than that, which has been the discussion multiple times in the past, it'd be good for me to be able to budget it. The reason why it's important <coughs> that I include these numbers if we're going to spend if we're even thinking about spending the money is because we compute all the indirect costs against budget. So if I don't include the numbers, we don't capture the overhead if we go back and add it after the fact. Because we can't go back and recruit, you know, uh, recompute every overhead department's costs uh, after we're already in the budget process. So that's why it's important if there's significant amounts of money that we put them in up front. I think the big issue is how much money should we spend on service agencies, not just whether we should include this or not include it. And I'll be honest with you, I don't know. The argument is that it saves the county money because if the agencies didn't do this work, the county would be have to fund the agencies. Or, or fund the service that the agencies do. Not, 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 act, not actually. Um, we're not required to fund any of the services that the service partners pick up. What happens is, for example, let's take drug and alcohol treatment as a safety net service, or temporary housing as a the safety net service. Exactly. If somebody doesn't get put in temporary housing and they're using drugs and alcohol, that means they end up in our jail because there's no other option. 
or it means if they're using drugs and alcohol, they end up over at mental health because they have a drug-induced psychosis rather than being treated for the addiction by the nonprofit. So it's not a direct responsibility of the county, but it's an indirect benefit to the county by diverting these people from a higher cost, more significant response to an earlier intervention, less significant cost. It's more prevention in terms of the county's impact. Kind of my gut feel runs that there's probably some validity at, you know, I'm being extreme on this, at $200,000. At $500,000, I have great question in my mind. And so, but I don't know how to get at the right answer. Well, I gotta be honest with you. With this uh, ballot measure 91 just passing, the marijuana legalization, I don't know what the impact is going to be to our system and how it's going to look like the increase because I know that's going to increase our system somehow. And it is so, frankly, prevention in that particular arena is going to have to be explored somehow because if not, I think I, I fear that we're going to end up with a lot more DA cases, we're going to end up with a lot more uh, people in jail, and it's going to end up. It's gonna, I don't know what the impacts will be. And there, when I talked to commissioners from Colorado, they definitely saw an increase in their public safety system as a result of this. So they're exploring the prevention side right now is trying to bring that cost of the public safety down by doing more preventive programs. So and that's, that was one of the major impacts they had. So it, it, we're going to have to have a, a serious discussion on this. Uh, a, a recommendation the other day that came out with maybe we should take and look at it's been a long time since we've analyzed who our service partners are and the work that we're trying to get done and maybe we should go out and take a look at that and say let's redo that it's been how long since we established the list that we have now yeah the reason why we didn't go out and redo that is because when we did it last time the budget committee said they were going to eliminate this funding over time if that was under different circumstances, we lost ONC revenue, we had this big operating deficit, we were closing libraries, we were doing all sorts of things. And each year, we backed off the amount of funding. Okay, So it, it didn't make sense if we're going to eliminate the funding to go through this big whole process. So if we're going to keep funding, and it's going to be an ongoing operating expense, it makes sense to go out and, and do this again. Now remember, these are safety net services, and we essentially established criteria for what safety net means, and we mirrored that criteria to what the city of Medford was doing at the time and other agencies that were like Red Cross and those types of agencies that support safety net services. There was a lot of fuss over, well, you're not funding the Medford Senior Center. Okay, well, Medford Senior Center didn't qualify as a safety net service. Um, and there were other things that got cut out of the, that were historically mostly politically funded, to be blunt about it, that were cut out once we developed criteria and applied that criteria. It's probably not going to change a lot if we use the same criteria. The commissioners are the ones that established that criteria, not the budget committee. Uh, and they essentially did it through a recommendation of the department. At the time, I think it was, uh, remember Angela, Angie, the one who talked real fast? Curtis. Curtis, yeah, uh, who facilitated it. Um, and I mean, we can do that again, but. You know, the, the direction had been to, you know, <coughs> essentially eliminate this funding. The city of Medford eliminated it. Yeah. And, you know, you were essentially following suit. So did they actually did it? I don't, yeah, I, think, I don't know if they did or not, April. Honestly, I can't remember. Theirs was a small contribution. The city of Medford was essentially, you know, funding about the same level we were. That's why it was significant. Now, I'll, you know, we haven't had a lot of complaints about the level of funding, but I'm sure that they would like to have more funding. I mean, everyone's gonna, everyone would like to have more funding, so. But the services they are delivering are working now. I don't personally, you know, I worked in public safety for 15 years, so I feel like I'm qualified to say this. I don't personally think the legalization of marijuana is gonna have a huge impact on our system. And the reason why is because most of the people that will be using it were people that were already using it. And they were probably having a bigger impact doing it illegally than they're gonna have doing it legally. Um, it will be the question about who begins to use it now that it's legal that wasn't doing it before. And so, you know, I don't think anyone can predict that. Um, but in terms of the, the safety net partners, I mean, they vary in the services they deliver. And, uh, 
we can I can we can do whatever you want. Well, it's speculative now, I know, but how about the potential um, marijuana tax revenue? You're earmarking it for these programs. I know that's not going to help in this budget cycle, but is that something that's been listed as a priority or as one that's so, it's passed yet by the voters? So, right, yeah, so it's all speculative. The state law that passed does earmark it for, for mental health services, a portion that comes to the county. Now, the state hasn't adopted rules for what those services mean. So, and they will, because that's they're required to do that, and it'll be the Department of Human Services that does it likely for the part that's for mental health services. And mental health services aren't necessarily safety net services, um, they're mental health. And typically mental health services are those things that qualify for Medicare and Medicaid. So there's a lot of things we can't do mm -hmm. with mental health dollars that the public would like us to do, but we can't because we would be violating federal law. Um, now the county's proposed tax will be discretionary. And, um, but but I, uh, my opinion about the county's proposed tax is that it will be years before we'll begin collecting a tax if we do begin collecting a tax because if it passes I have no doubt that it'll be litigated as to whether or not preemption you know is a is a is a basis for a legal argument when the measure specifically said anything that existed prior to the measure is eliminated and so but it'll be a legal argument so I, I wouldn't certainly base this budget or the next couple of budgets on anything that may happen from the but that preemption is only on the recreational side, the medicinal side wouldn't be impacted by that. Yeah, but remember that there's a legal argument there as well because medical marijuana laws say that it's a non-profit activity and we're charging on income based on sales, sales, and technically there aren't sales. So it will, and no one's challenged, no, that's not been through the legal system yet. So that's why it hasn't because everyone said there aren't sales. It's, right, it's, Nonprofit, right? What it's costing. So it's all very speculative, obviously. It's not yeah. Pay decision making. On. It's I, I wouldn't say now for sure. It's an industry that's brand new and very important. Right. Mr. Chair. Yes. Uh, well, I'll say my piece here, and and, uh, and we'll be part of the, your final decision. But uh, you, I think you know how to feel. If if, if one uh, is around and seeing and. I'm, this has nothing to do with the marijuana situation, but uh, on uh, these uh, uh, fail safe uh, or, or what do we call them? I forget the name, just one blank here. But uh, these agencies that are supplying services to the citizens of Jackson County uh, that may not have otherwise, they're not mandated. Uh, so it's not our responsibility from a pure legal uh, standpoint, but I think as uh, as the governing body of this county, I think we have a responsibility, a moral responsibility to assist however we can. And, uh, I've seen the work that these folks do. I have no connection with any of them, but I've seen the work that they do. And so I, I as I said, when uh, this last year, when we're going to do our issue, but uh, I think this is a viable, very viable service to the citizens of Jackson County. I can see a good cut, and I'm doing it up front this time. Uh, I would like to see us fund at the, at the level we work because I've seen the work they've done. And I think if anybody spends any time out there in our community and sees us, I think that they might come to the same dream. So set my piece. So I, I'd just like to add to, to Don's comments. You know, um, over the past years, we've reduced this, I think, from 550 <coughs> to 600,000, something like 550. that. 550 to the level that, that we see here on this page. And, you know, I agree with Don that these nonprofit organizations um, struggle to, to make ends meet, and and they uh, they provide a very valuable service to our community. And I'd like to see us agree in this budget cycle on on a level of funding, and not have to have this conversation every single year. I mean, what we're talking about is three or four hundred thousand dollars, and it is a minuscule piece of the total general fund budget and we spend an inordinate amount of time talking about this every year. So I think that let's just have our, 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 our come to Jesus, if you will, conversation around this um, in this budget cycle and, and land on an amount that um, we can live with and say we've cut deep enough or um, um, and, and let folks count on these, this, this grant funding um, as they plan their budgets going forward. So. 
Well, on your basis, then maybe it was 378, and it's proposed for 330. Maybe we could settle on 350. That's a compromise. I just think we need to we need to do that. And I don't know whether today's the right day to do that or not. But. I, I would just say I, I've been out in the community. I've been a volunteer as much or more than anybody else. Yes, they they provide services, but I don't know that that's the county's role. The taxpayer has now a library tax and an extension service tax, and they're paying more and more and more. And I think what they want us to do is to be prudent with their money. And I can't see increasing it. I would decrease it, Roger. The taxpayer is paying enough. And if you look at the money that's flown in, that has flowed into human services county, it's huge. There's a huge increase of money coming in to the county that's coming out of the federal government, but it has been huge. But it so, can't be used for this purpose, though, just right. so you Well, know. I think it is, if you look at other programs. I mean, you've got to look at what these are, and where do they really use it? I mean, I went through all of that. It's a smattering of this and that, and, and maybe it's a safety Well, what they use it for may be the case, but what I'm telling you is the money the county received yeah. can't be funneled to these nonprofits for this service. No, it can't, but they're, they're, they're mostly dealing with behavioral health problems. And there's a huge amount of money that has come into the county for behavioral health issues. Huge. Well, yeah, those, federal, those federal grants are actually dropping to April. Well, they will. That, that they money will, is, is not because we can't afford them. That, well, okay, you go spend some time in nurturing center. I understand you're, you've been a great volunteer. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not debating that. I'm just saying that there, there are agencies out here, nonprofits, that are doing really good work. They are. On very little money. They don't pay all that much money. A lot of those folks are almost volunteer wages that are staff. Uh, and like, like, if we don't have those, if we, as a county, I'm talking about as a county, not county government necessarily, don't have those things, um, we'll be the poorer for it. I would disagree. I think we have so many, a proliferation of 501c3s. Every time you turn around, there's another one, and they duplicate each other's services over and over and over. And I think it's it's time to, it isn't the county's business. If they really provide the service that is that quality, they'll survive. Well, there are you and I disagree, because yep, I think it's a nice service. So. <laughs> and I agree. I think in a duplication of services, something we have to watch for in spending their money. Craig, was your idea that there would be a set amount, uh, and that, let's say we pick Dick's recommendation of 350, and that would have a CPI increase every year? Yeah, yeah, okay. that would make sense to me. Sure. I would agree. I can that. get behind that that concept. I, I do want to say, remember, one budget committee can't bind another. You can have principles. <laughs> that that's what right. you want to do. Sure. The next budget okay. committee could say no. The next, the budget committee could recommend it. And the next board commissioners could say no. We're not going to spend it. We're mm -hmm. going to do something different. So there's. I just want to make right. sure that we're not agreeing to something that we think. It's well, binding because it's not. I, I think we're trying to agree to an amount that would be. You could budget. You ask us, is this appropriate? Yeah, I, you know, one thing I want to say, and I wish I would have brought, but, but, you know, each year we hand you out the information as to what the service partners were. And I, I agree that some of it is behavioral health, but, you know, emergency housing isn't behavioral health, and the county doesn't want to be in the business of providing emergency housing. Providing meals to disabled people or you know, people that qualify for uh, those services isn't a business the county wants to get into. Nonprofits do those things for way less expensively than the county does. Uh, some of those people, I mean, honestly, would all, <laughs> you can go over to the jail and some people purposely get arrested so they can go have a place to sleep that's out of the weather so that they can get three meals and we pay $120 a day to serve someone that way. A nonprofit might spend 10 bucks to do the same thing. And so, yes, some of it's behavioral, but a lot of it are services that we don't want to have to get into. Mr. Chair, you know, I'm looking at this. Uh, it, take the nonprofits completely out of it. Don't look at who you're funding. Look at it. Look at it as an amount and saying, okay, this is this is dollars that we're putting into a prevention program, because these dollars, if we don't do this, will end up being a, a cost to the system that's two and a half times this in the long run. So it's, you know, I spent 20 years in public safety in the fire side. I learned a long time ago, if you go out there and spend prevention dollars, you don't have to spend the operations dollars to go put the fires out. Or you don't end up spending as many in-home medicals because people are able to take care of themselves. And that has a dramatic increase, a decrease on the operating budgets of the other departments. So 
it's it's a it's a concept of saying, and it's a very hard shift to make, but we made it in the fire service almost 30 years ago, and saying we're going to fund prevention, and that had a huge impact on our operations. So, and, and we were able to provide more for less dollars at, with that thought process. So it's a it's a fundamental thought process. Don't look at who you're funding. I'm asking, just look at how the big picture and how it flows out. And I, I personally see the, the 378 that we currently funded last year is money well spent in a situation that if we don't spend it, it's going to impact us in other ways that we don't, that some people just don't understand that because if the cost will be there, it'll just be in a higher zone, it'll be somewhere else. Nice question. Are there any performance met metrics or reporting that these agencies provide so you know where you're getting your bang for the buck? There's a lot of that that comes out. I have never seen it. Okay. I mean, is that I, I, I take a tour of some of these nonprofits no, and you can see yeah. what they're doing. Yeah. So when, but I mean, when, as far as reporting, when this report was done five years or so ago, uh, Mark Orndorff and his staff did this, and they went out and they surveyed all of these agencies, and there were a lot of metrics that that came with that analysis, and then we prioritized these groups into three tiers, and we've only memory serves me right, I'm looking at Danny, but we, we only just fund the the top tier of, of these three tiers. No, I think it's, it's so pro rata. Rata. Does it, is it pro rata? I think it's oh, oh, I yeah, know. I just don't remember. I think it's kind of pro no, there, there, there were three tiers and you only funded the top tier. That's what I thought. Those, really? those yeah. are based on I the metrics uh, and the actual yeah. outcomes? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. those metrics so. haven't been updated. What, what, the, what the, the essential yeah. metric was hmm. is do these things actually have an impact on county services? Okay. So everyone was everyone was um, measured with the same, you know, what, are, what what is safety net? And those things haven't been updated. My guess is they haven't changed. I mean, to be one. What that was, was, and it was Dick's recommendation at the time, he wanted us to split out the ones that actually would have an impact on the county financially mm -hmm. based on the department's expertise from the ones that may, from the ones we know that don't. And that's how that tier was set up. So the idea was if we're going to invest money, there has to be something that the county gets in return, and that's how come we picked yeah. it up. And pulling that all together was no casual effort, as I recall. There was a lot of work was done by Mark and his staff, and um, it was a pretty quality uh, study, as I, as I recall. Yeah, um, we had interviews with every agency yeah. that submitted proposals, and we had, you know, I mean, there, it, it was a couple, two and a half, three month process. So, so they probably the, the tier wouldn't change necessarily unless there was some efficiency within an organization that they have changed. Or there's, a new, or there's a new, you know, a new, new service that someone's new delivering service. that qualify. Yeah. Or a service that, that is, doesn't need the money because they're doing a good job. I think yeah. one, one that got cut out, for example, was um, legal aid. Yeah. I mean, it's a safety net service, but it doesn't do anything for the county per se. Right. So it got put into one of those maybes, right, as opposed to just absolutely not. So there were things, I mean, and I can't remember, there was... I think the county... There, there the were several of them. Didn't apply. I think the county. I don't know. Are you rallying the troops here? Don't yeah. Oh, geez. Speaking no, of human no, services, no, they're coming. I'm, I'm just. I'm, I give up, Don. The cavalry's coming. <laughs> <laughs> you that one. Into the valley of the death with the balance 600. Don't shoot me. Well, I'm just looking at where we come. Are we putting more money away? in our rainy day fund and, and what's the right number and you know there's very little places you can do it and this is one of them and I'm not against maintaining but I don't, sure don't want to increase um, well, let, let me get how, how about if we come back to this and we get through the rest of the budget <laughs> all right huh. you ask us no no I, and I, I do know. want to come back yeah. to it but I think the rest of the budget information will be helpful to you to talk about this yeah. is that okay Dick? Yeah, I, I think where we're at though is let's fix an amount, talk about what's an appropriate amount, and, and then I think we need to take another look at the service agencies to be sure those are the ones we want to fund under the criteria that they do something for the county. But this is all the money there is. If you add one, you have to take it away from somebody else. If you eliminate a couple, you can add it to wherever it makes sense to have it. Offsets. Yeah. Huh? Offsets. Offsets. Yeah. Make sure there's an offset. We, we can do that. Here, here's the thing. Okay. 
and Craig kind of explained how thorough the process was. That costs money. The process costs money. We don't fund human services to manage these grants. We don't give them any dollars. We don't. They don't have staff that are hired for this purpose. So if you want all of that stuff done, we can do it, but it costs money. And uh, it takes a staff person, at least one, to facilitate all of this. And the general fund can't burden the dedicated funds. That's an illegal use of all those funds to do it. So um, can you require the agencies to self-report things that we're we need to look at as far as to determine? Well, someone has to put together essentially an RFP process. Someone has to receive applications. Someone has to put together a committee to read those applications. Someone has to meet with the board and budget committee to determine what criteria you want to use. I mean, there's a whole process right. that costs money. We once talked about just giving the money to United Way and telling them to distribute it to that criteria. We talked about that, and United Way is willing to do that, and they're willing to do it for, uh, I think, 10%. I mean, they have an administrative cost. 10% mm -hmm. is actually low. Yeah, it is. You know, but, right. but what I'm saying is right now, we're not paying an administrative cost to human services to develop this. And if you want all of that stuff done, that's fine. But we, you can't use dedicated funds. This is not a dedicated fund uh, purpose. And so if you... Okay. All so we need to do is settle on an amount. Is that right? That would be, that would be, yeah. I mean, because we already have essentially a process in place. Now, if we want to change that, that's what I'm saying is going to take the work and staff time and all that kind of stuff. And it's fine. We can spend the money there. But we're going to have to give them some money to do that so that we, you know. They actually did a really good job of it. Yeah. They, mm -hmm. they really did do a good job of sorting through it. They had high caliber volunteers do it, working on it. And it's extremely credible process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you'd like to see the results of it, then we do enter into contracts with each of the service agencies, so it's not like we just give them the money mm -hmm. and we have measurable... And they are required to report. Okay. okay. But we could. Right. We ought to right. see right. some... Like to see yeah. I'd like to see it at some point, because I've never seen it. What do you think? Uh, Mr. Chair, I would recommend we take the 350 figure that you uh, recommend and put it in the budget with CPI increases. Yeah. Okay. Well, you can't... You can't do it now. Right. No, right. let's just take so a stall. Let's just take a stall. I agree. It isn't binding. We're, we're trying to get you a number. So. No, I agree. Yeah. How are we setting policy, right? Yeah. Well, for this budget, you are. <laughs> setting policy as what we'd like to see in the future, mm -hmm. no different than our other policies. But. I could go accept. I could go along with that. Well, it wouldn't make any difference when I disagree. Doug? I'm fine with that. I, I think you don't have to make a decision, but I think that's a reasonable figure to. Okay. I, I would not. I wouldn't look at the uh, contracts and stuff. I'd agree yeah, to an amount. Okay. Well, why don't you use 350 and let's move on. Okay. Um, IT is pretty self-explanatory. There's just the CPI change. The library, we backed out the general fund support. Remember, there was also $800 in addition to that, roughly, uh, that amount that we're not spending on libraries anymore. Mail courier, we keep. I mean, we processed all that through the branch libraries because the vans travel all throughout the county to deliver mail. We do have, we, we still will have a library budget, potentially, but it just won't be a general fund library budget because we are still contracting for the service and the library district is subcontracting with us to deliver the service. Uh, they may or may decide, may or may not decide to continue to do that. So we're kind of waiting to hear what they want to do. We still will continue to own the buildings. So um, we own all of the materials and supplies and bands and computers and phones and all of that kind of stuff as well. So uh, we'll keep a mail courier. We'll have a library budget if they decide they want to continue to contract with us. If they don't, that's fine too. Uh, but it just won't be in the general fund. Building maintenance on the library's budget. Yeah, it, we, we budget building maintenance and it's part of their contract. Mm -hmm. They pay us for that maintenance. So if they have major system failures, HVAC system goes out. The district out. pays more. Good. Any other question? Where's the law library figure into this? The law library is a separate fund. It's dedicated, so it doesn't figure into this. Okay. It's it's not general fund. This is just general fund obligations, right? Mm -hmm. 
I mean, we'll continue to deliver law library services. We, you know, we could subcontract it to the district if the district decides to go off on their own, but right now they're contracting with us. So the law library is pretty small amount of money speak in comparison to everything else we're doing. Um, let's see. Roads and parks, they don't receive any general fund. The sheriff's office, um, essentially you'll see a reduction of the 405000 That would have been 376000 more, which would account for the video lottery funds, but uh, we set, set uh, 376000 to the union. Um, and then there was one time carryover of 31824 from search and rescue that we backed out. So we backed that out, then we added the CPI adjustment to that base to come up to 21201. Uh, emergency management, we just added a CPI to. Justice Court, we increased the revenue 1.5% as a projection, and that's all it is, is a projection. So it generates a million 32 in the budget this year to the general fund. Now remember, once we receive that million and 32, it's budgeted against the sheriff's budget. It's part of the appropriation we give to the sheriff for the traffic team. So it's not a net revenue when you account for those expenditures. So overall, you're looking at about a 4.22 million reduction. For well, I'm not. I'm not done yet. Let's. I want to go over. Uh, let's go over revenues first before I answer your question. Um, so I want you to notice the first line on there because it's one I'm pretty proud of. <laughs> um, we're gonna, we we're begin, beginning to generate an ongoing operating revenue from that building that we uh, invested in over there, one point, almost 1.3 million. If you remember, I suggested that we increase the animal shelter funds, 287000 That comes from this. So essentially, we're changing the color of money. It's dedicated money. They're paying us rent, becomes general fund. We're reallocating a portion of it back to them for those general fund purposes that they couldn't fund directly with dedicated funds. Um, I told you that I thought we would generate at least a million dollars a year, so I feel like I still delivered what I said I would deliver if we uh, do that, and that's why I recommended we do it. Um, we'll also get a one-time upfront payment of $4 million. That's the $4 million we spent on the parking garage to increase the capacity, and that will buy them a 35-year lease on the parking garage. But we're getting the general fund money back right up front, and then they'll pay this lease rate. Buck 25 a foot is what it is. Um, which is the lower end of the market, um, so they're getting a good deal, but they also invested a lot. So uh, we think it's, it's pretty fair. Um, solid waste transfer, uh, you'll see just a slight increase in projection. <coughs> Property tax, um, prior year property tax, you'll see goes down just slightly. Part of the reason is because we're getting more payments in current year property taxes. So that means prior year would go down, right? Mm -hmm. If you look at ONC, now this is budgeting for a cut because without secure rural schools or public law 110 or 106, 393 or any of those public laws, then we still qualify for a portion of the cut. Now our portion of the cut used to be up in the 20, 30, 40 million dollar range. Now it's down to one and a half million dollars if there is a cut. 1.65 is what we're proposing. Actual receipts. Actual receipts. Okay. Now, when secure rural schools passes or any legislation passes, you have the choice of which you want. You can continue to take your portion of the cut or you can take secure rural schools. And essentially, we usually take what, whatever's more, which has been secure rural schools. Um, I will say that this year, the number that I got, we got, Harvey called and got from Rocky McVeigh was 2.9 million if we had qualified for a timber cut this year. But that's a, that's, you know, an anomaly in what we usually uh, cut. We usually cut about a million and a half, so I did increase it a little bit. If, if there's another year like this year, that means our fund, you know, our operating 
um, uh, revenue would have a larger uh, balance. My guess is the market was really good this year and they cut a lot of contracts they've been sitting on in this particular year. Possibly, but you know, I, I, I would, I, as I said, I'm always conservative on revenues mm -hmm. because I don't want to, you know, uh, under deliver. So I put it, uh, it moved from 1.5 million to 1.6, or 1.55 million to 1.65 million. Uh, property tax, you can see we had a pretty good increase, 1.86 million. Uh, state liquor revenue down a little bit. Um, the amusement device fee, which is also a state revenue, down a little bit. Uh, no BLM, federal entitlement, cigarette tax down. All of our state revenues are still, they're down. They've been dropping every year. Uh, so you see our total revenues at 40 million, 689,000. So what I'm showing you there is an operating surplus, which is the first time it's happened in the history since I've been here. Uh, of 1.167 million, which is about the amount of the HHS building. <laughs> I have no. Um, I do also want to say that remember in last year's budget we had a 5.2 million operating deficit. So and we did pass the library. We didn't, but the voters passed the library district and extension district, which chopped away 5.2. But we still have another 1.67. That means that. We reduced our budget, as Doug was pointing out, um, significantly so that we closed the gap of the operating deficit because of the districts, but we also uh, would have closed the gap without the operating districts, and we moved into positive territory now. So, you know, uh, I figure that all sorts of people will come out of the woodworks knowing if we have an operating uh, um, surplus. But I, and I want to point out a few things. Um, that amount of money is probably about seven cents in property tax. So we could choose not to levy seven cents of our property tax. I would not recommend that. I'm just telling you because you, you have that option. So instead of the $2.01, we could cut that back about seven cents, which would put us at zero operating surplus, which is a bad move in my opinion because there's always unanticipated expenses and unanticipated revenues. The other reason why I'm not recommending we do that yet, I mean, if we continue to have a surplus, I certainly would recommend we do that at some point. But we also potentially have a $4 million liability with PERS, uh, depending on what happens with the court cases. So that million dollars would get eaten up, and so would $3 million in fund balance if we pay it off. Uh, so those are the two uh, major reasons. I will say that I've talked with the commissioners about the library facilities and the bond debt we have there. And potentially, depending on if Congress reauthorizes us for the next couple of years, we could build a large enough fund balance so that we could stop assessing the tax on the bond and set the funds up in a reserve to make the debt payment for the remainder of the, the bond. So we, we do have the potential to reduce some taxes, which I can say we've done that two times since I've been here. No other local government has reduced taxes. We've done it twice. And this will give us an opportunity potentially to reduce our permanent rate limit. I'm not recommending we do that this year. And also the bond debt rate on the libraries. But we need to wait and see what Congress does because we certainly don't want to spend down our fund balance uh, buying that debt off. But as opposed to growing the fund balance, we could buy the debt off. When I say buy the debt off, stop assessing taxes for the uh, bond payments on the libraries by setting it up in a reserve. So those are just thoughts that I had when I saw, wow, we have $1.1 .1 million surplus. Um, we're heading in the right direction. I don't think those things are mature enough to move forward with now. I would hate to see us reduce taxes and then go have something happen, like we get a PERS debt and go, wow, we don't have enough <coughs> money to pay for this now. So um, I don't think the public would be appreciative of that. They may be in the short run because we reduce taxes, but. I will say the last two times we reduced taxes, we got really no acknowledgement <laughs> from that. Uh, in fact, I bet most of you around the table don't even know which taxes we reduced. Um, and you would think people would know that because we're the only local government that's done it. But we reduced the permanent rate limit on the um, urban renewal district. And we reduced, we paid off the juvenile bond debt early. Mm -hmm. So, um, district. 
lighting district is a district. I know, but you reduced that one. Well, so. We reduced the amount that we're lighting. Yeah. I'm saying we eliminate, you know, eliminated taxes the other way. So I don't even think there was an article in the paper about it. The libraries are the only bond issue outside of the regular assessment we have in the county. They're the only GO bond issue. Yeah. We have revenue bonds on the airport, but the airport fund funds those. We have a credit line on the Human Services Building, which we set aside the funds for in the general fund. Um, it's not a bond, though. It's a credit line, and it's not secured against the full faith and credit of the general fund. The GO bonds are, the revenue bonds aren't. We didn't, did we do the revenue bonds against it? We didn't at the airport. So the GO bonds are the only ones that are a, a property tax assessed bond that the county has, and those are the libraries. And they got about seven years left, so my thought is, this year and next year would put us down to five years. Those payments from O and C, if they were equivalent to the current level or more, would almost shore up the full amount. We might have to take a little bit out of reserve two years from set it up and reduce the taxes for the bond debt. What is the total bond service uh, payment per year? There's a couple of series. Looking at about 1.5 for each of the two libraries here. It's about three million dollars. What was that question? The total uh, bond outstanding bonds. Well, the total uh, annual payment. Oh, because if we're talking about limited. Yeah, it's payment. about three million a year. Okay. So I mean, if you put that into a permanent rate limit, you know, every five cents buys us about eight hundred fifty thousand. So we're reducing taxes significantly. Yeah. We're not prepared to do it yet. It's right. going to depend on a couple of things that happen, but I think we can get there if history repeats itself with those things. Are we adding just one FTE, or will I see more? In the general fund, we just added the appropriation for the one FTE. After we adopted the budget this year, the sheriff added two FTE, but he did it within his current appropriation. And so he'll fund those within the budget target we gave him. So we won't add funding, but we added FTE. And uh, I've talked with the sheriff who's coming in. He believes his budget is adequate, that he doesn't need additional funds, um, and that he could make a lot of changes in how it's being managed to meet the needs that he feels need to be met. So um, that's why you didn't see any significant changes there as well. But in the general fund, yeah, it's that it's that one position. Okay, the services is still adding position. Oh, sure. <laughs> I think yeah, of the going from eight to nine hundred, I think. What well, kind of them were there? Wrap this up, but at one time when you first came here, you wanted to set up enough reserves. To in the range of 100 million, and with interest rates increasing for a permanent level of funding from that money, are you still thinking that way, or are you thinking we'd be better to spend it on these other? Well, here, here's my opinion, and I'm just going to give you my opinion administratively. This doesn't That's take politics into account. What I'm asking you know, is, um, I think it's a bad idea to set a minimum level of what our fund balance should be. Not because I think we should spend more than that, because typically what happens then is people who make decisions go, wow, if we got more than that minimum level, we can spend it. Now, not everyone makes, not when I say typically, I don't mean every person individually, but my experience has been if we set a, a, a minimum level of 25 million and we got 30 million, people are fine with spending 5 million because we, we aren't at our minimum level. On, on the contrary to that, my opinion is that we should build our fund balance rather than essentially reduce taxes because it causes us not have to raise fees and taxes by generating a revenue from the investment portfolio we have. Um, like most people would do to prepare themselves for daily living expenses when they're retired. Um, my proposal back then, and we got to $73 million in general fund balance, so we got pretty close, and we would have hit 100, but we, we spent money on things. We were in 5.5%. So there's a five and a half million dollars a year uh, in operating revenue. Mm -hmm. Now that's uh, what is that? Uh, Sixty cents of tax rate. So I would prefer not, you know, <coughs> to be able to generate the revenue ourselves than have to assess tax. If we just use it to eliminate tax now, that doesn't <coughs> perpetuate itself in the future. It's great for people who are in office now and the public today because they go, well, wow, we got a tax reduction, but it's temporary. If you build the fund balance and you invest it and you have a return each year and you evaluate your return each year, then you have a permanent tax reduction. So to me, it makes more sense administratively and fiscally to do it that way rather than we got a surplus, let's reduce, reduce taxes this year. 
The other thing is, do you still think our costs over time are going to go up at seven percent, and our revenue about from uh, property taxes probably around five? No, I wouldn't say five. Uh, you know, at the peak we were growing about six percent a year, but that's when there were ten thousand homes being built on any given day. Right. Um, it's limited to three percent, except for new construction. This year we came in, you know, close to four. Um, but I would say between four and five unless we have another downturn in the economy is what we can probably bank on. I, I suspect, you know, we used to grow at about almost 8% a year. We got that down to 7% by doing some things like setting up a side account with PERS and reducing our ongoing payroll costs, by downsizing the organization, by outsourcing and privatizing a lot of stuff. Um, the only way we get rid of that operating deficit is either to eliminate services, meaning staff, or outsource them. You know where it's a less expensive cost, but I suspect seven percent would be a good estimate if you know based on current service level. So you're talking about a three percent shortfall. Yeah, and I mean, when we say a yeah, shortfall, I mean, if let everything, say no, wait a minute, if everything would remain static, yeah, you'd be talking about how each year we'd be three percent less to cover that. Yeah, I mean, if I was gonna, you know, I. I I, I, I didn't feel justified in doing this. I thought that it would be disingenuous, so I wouldn't do it. But the million one surplus, I could have said, let's set budget targets at 4%, and we would add no surplus. Now, at 4%, we're still cutting 3%, because their costs are going up 7%. So, I mean, I'm justified in it that way. However, last year we set budget targets at 1%, and we made it work. A shortfall is a question that doesn't have a specific answer, because we have a shortfall in the general fund. But that doesn't mean they won't make that 3% up going to a dedicated fund, a grant source, a fee, an enterprise fund. There's all sorts of ways to make up those costs. So sometimes we cut to make up those costs, but sometimes we find the revenue in another place. So I don't want to say we specifically have a shortfall of 3 or 3.5%. I mean, if you're only looking at the general fund and you assume that there aren't other options, then yes, you're correct. But there are other options. Right. <clears throat> but the general revenue curves, if you look at them over time, uh, we can say about 4% revenue and 7% cost increase. It's still, you know, here's the problem right now. When we have this downturn in our economy, a lot of property values went below the maximum assessed value. So that became the new value. And if the property values jump quickly, like 10% a year, people's property taxes can go up 10% until they hit that maximum assessed value again. So while, while the market's moving upward quickly, 10, 12% a year across the whole market, we're gonna see more return on property tax because people aren't limited to 3% until they hit the maximum assessed value again. So I don't think even 4% across the county this year is a true representation of where we'll level out. I think that's impacted because we had a lot of properties that had a long way to go back up to the maximum assessed value and their values the taxable value went up significantly on a lot of properties. Once we hit maximum assessed value, then I'll be able to answer your question. But, you know, I can I can give you my best guess. I think 4% is a little bit high. I mean, where we are almost near 6%, it was, un, it was, it was unsustainable because you know the the building was outpacing the buying. So I think even 4%. As a projection, is probably a little high, I, I, but I'm always conservative. I would say three percent. I'm conservative on our expenses. I'd say we'll stay at least seven percent. So I, here's this question, Danny, when we're on this thing, because I, I was getting ready to ask very similar questions to, to what you just asked. Um, so if we doubled this um, this three and a half percent increase on the expense side, yeah, I, I can't add this up, but it looks like it's. Three and a half percent is maybe like one and a half million dollars, maybe in, in the ballpark there. So if we doubled it, it'd be another one and a half million dollars. Let's say I'm not saying that we should. I'm just saying if we did and recognize that the departments really need to grow seven percent, but we're growing them three and a half percent, and we're expecting them to find the difference someplace. Okay, trust me, I understand that concept. Right. But if if we looked at it that the perfect budget would be that we grew them 
and then we looked at the revenue, obviously we're going to be a little short. Okay. So is our budget policy, and I'm just, it's just a concept, is our budget policy, does it need to be that we ultimately, in the perfect world, we're growing these departments by the actual rate of growth that they need to grow by? Should that be our long-term goal? I just, I just put it out there. Yeah, and I explain this every year. Here's, I mean, yeah, I'll say yes to your question in a perfect world, but here's why it's an imperfect world and why I wouldn't recommend we do that. Each year, there's a difference between our budget, which is what we're talking about here, and accounting for our budget. Mm -hmm. When we account for our budget, we underspend it every year, two, three million bucks. So while departments costs grow based on what we budget at 7%, their actual expenditures don't. That's why we're underspending their budgets. Mm -hmm. And the reason why they don't is because we'll account for 10 positions, but they may have a, a vacancy rate of 10%, meaning all year long they go along and don't spend money on one position. Now it could be three months for one, three months for another, three months for another, three months for another. So that growth rate of 7% assumes the budget, not the accounting for the budget. I so I think, you know, um, if we budgeted, if we, if we brought it up to 7% in a perfect world, then at the end of the year, instead of having two or three million, we're gonna have five or six million underspent based on how, our, how, our, how we actually account for what we budget. So I, that's why I wouldn't recommend we do it, but I get your logic and it makes sense. Mm -hmm. But it's not that perfect. If we knew that the sheriff's office, for example, was gonna be fully staffed all the time, then yes. But we know there are things that are gonna affect, we're budgeting like they're gonna be fully staffed because we have to, by law, budget the appropriation for them to be fully staffed and the FTE, but we know they're not gonna be fully staffed because they have a year-long hiring process. So, I mean, we have to take those variables into account. Sure, but we're asking the departments to manage their vacancies in order to balance their budget, in some, potentially in some cases. I'm not, yeah, no, I I'm not wanting to argue with you, I just no. want to no, you're, have you're, you're this right. conversation. Yeah. So, um, if they have to keep vacant positions vacant in order to hit their budget each year, what services are they not providing that they should be providing because they have vacant positions? Whereas maybe if they had more funding in their budget, they'd be hiring temporary employees. Let, let me say this. In that, I yeah. just jump in real quick. Um, I've been in an HR director for a while. Yeah. Um, <laughs> one, of the, one of those many hats. Two, two years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you had a break. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, well, um, so what happens usually is as soon as they know if somebody is going to be leaving or retiring, they don't they don't wait around to try to fill that position. We get the request immediately, mm -hmm. um, and so we start the process to to recruit. But you know the time you have to go through, especially if it's a union position, you have to go through first. You know whether it's a union person who wants to. Internal recruitment. Sure, I then we totally do understand. Internal recruitment, and then you know, the time it takes to get in, and so on and so forth. And three months is, is pretty good to get that position. We, we so. don't have anyone purposely holding position. So it could be that they're doing that to balance their budget, but they don't have to because just by course of action, they're having vacancies, even though they're trying to fill them. Okay. I'm pretty sure they have in the past. I've heard people say that. But I, yeah. Right. Would it would it take away the incentive to look for efficiencies, greater efficiencies, and uh, prudent cuts where necessary? I mean, uh, if you're if you're funding them at what you're estimating the full increase would be, then it doesn't give them necessarily incentive to look for right. So all, all I think I'm really trying to say here is that at a very high level, if if we're getting to, and this is a good problem to have that all of a sudden we have operating <coughs> surplus. You know, how do you spend operating surplus? Do we, does, do we save it all? Do we spend some, save some? Do we spend it all? And if we're going to spend some, how do we spend it? Do we spend it in one-time allocations, you know, for special projects? Or um, do we let the commissioners just do um, different things like they did with the Historical Society? 
or do we say that that well, or do we say that there's a plan that there and, and we've had we've had a concept and and a plan for all these years of cutting back, you know, and so if if hopefully you know, this is year one of several years of surpluses, what's the plan? Okay, and I, and I think that's a conversation that we should have. I, I would agree. Um, I followed your plan with this. Yes, you did. And, right. and yeah. I'm not criticizing. No, no, I, I know. And what I would say is that that additional surplus isn't spent. It will go into the fund balance. Mm -hmm. That's what we've been doing every year with additional surplus. Right. My, uh, my thought on that, though, is that, um, you know, 1.1 million on a $40 million budget is 3%. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't be having that discussion with a 3% operating surplus. Mm -hmm. Now, if we start building a balance, or we have a larger operating surplus, I think it's time to have that discussion. This is a one-time, first time <laughs> ever, yeah. and I'm glad. I mean, I'm very glad, but remember, it's 3% of the general fund budget. So uh, to me, uh, it's it's not anything to have. It's rainy day, buddy. Yeah, and, but, but that is, you're right, that if, if this becomes the case, then we're gonna need some direction for developing budgets, because as I said, like you, you know, and cutting back, you provided these budget policies, and they apply to cutting back. And this budget is treated, even though we have a surplus, under those same policies. So I would agree that at some point, it needs to be a policy discussion, especially if we start seeing this year after year, and especially if the amount grows. Yeah. Well, my feeling is, let's be as frugal as we've always been in the past. We build a surplus to the point we're happy with it, or it's enough. Good Lord, let's give the taxpayer a break. Can I can we do executive session? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. I just any other questions mm -hmm. on this before we go to executive can we session? Take a couple minutes before we do that. I'll give you exactly five minutes or less. <laughs> I think that, that won't take quite that long. Five minutes. <laughs>